repeat myself, I repeat myself. I'm sorry. This is the part where I, I repeat myself. myself. I repeat myself. I repeat myself. A little this is the part where I repeat myself. I repeat myself. A good Monday morning to you and welcome to an April 19th edition of Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson here with you, Samuel G. Brooks, the technical producer of this program. We have uh, uh, kind of a rockin' and rollin' Monday start uh, to today's show. Melissa Cowett will join us. She's uh, VP of Government Relations, Business Development at Canadian Strategy Group. She's a, a political strategist and she's a government relations expert and we thought of Melissa when we uh, were taking a look at the climate plan, the pitch, if you will, that Conservative Party of Canada leader Aaron O'Toole made to Canadians last week. Melissa's going to dig into that. Of course, we probably don't have to tell you that today is budget day. So for the first time in about two years, Canadians will see a new budget from uh, the Liberals, from the federal government. And uh, of course, this one in a pandemic era in a pandemic age, going to look a little bit different than previous budgets, but but maybe not as as big budget as you're expecting. In other words, the federal government, per sources, has has made commitments to keep the budget uh, under a certain amount, including its plans for childcare, a ten dollar a day childcare, new hiring credit for employers and other angles that we're going to take a look at. We'll speculate a little bit about that today, and then tomorrow's show will have more fulsome coverage, if you will. Uh, we'll have a budget roundtable coming up tomorrow on April 20th. Uh, by the way, we'll also have a 420 roundtable as it is April 20th. Maybe we'll call it the Puff Puff Pass Real Talk Roundtable. Sam, what do you think? I think I think, uh, I, I, I think that we uh, – there's probably some uh, – I think that's a working title. I think we can massage that one a little bit better. You're going to get better than Puff Puff Pass well, okay, on a 420 fine. round table? Yeah. That, that, was, that was a confident take. Okay, well, you know what? I will retract that because no, I you can't don't have think to. of anything you, better. You can't think of anything. Okay. To me, it sounded a little, yeah, it sounded a little uh, a little clunky, but at the same time, it's just like, well, now I get it. Now, nope, it works. It works. What's clunk? Okay, I'm not yeah. going to. What's clunky about it? I think when you tack round table onto it, it's like puff, puff, pass, and round the puff, table. puff, pass panel. There you go. Okay, this was yeah. this was us collaborating. See, and working I think together. that like to me, it just it, it seemed it seemed like a it seemed like two two ideas kind of smushed together. That yes. that flows a little. But better. in but in that sense, perhaps that's the irony of it. Perhaps we invite a little discomfort to create. Well, the there you go. What are we even doing right now? So the puff, puff panel, the puff, puff, pass panel. Oh, my gosh. People are like, can you guys please focus on the fact that the federal budget's coming out and it's a huge day and we're going to take it seriously. We are. $10 a day child care is going to get a lot of people interested and it's going to get a lot of people talking. So. If you well, think of what's engaged our audience on conversations that we've had since our inception, uh, coming up on five months now, child care has been one of the huge ones. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I think that it's... People are ready for it, and and I mean, I hope they follow through with this properly. Quebec has been a very, very good model, like not only yeah. just for Canada, but like a lot of the world actually looks to the Quebec model as a way to do childcare effectively, and it shouldn't be that difficult to expand it nationally. This is one that that, that 
you know, and these are all, I mean, there's been some great reporting by the Toronto Star on this, Globe and Mail, CBC. We've been paying attention to a lot of it. Their bureau chiefs and their, their so-called insiders are taking a look here, and nobody can cite their sources except to say, you know, senior government officials, for example, are saying this, but it's all on condition of anonymity because the budget's not yet been released. Uh, it's also obviously why we're not really digging into the details this morning because you know we haven't seen it uh so that's going to be a big part of today and then and then tomorrow we'll take a look but but some of the reporting uh early on says the federal government is is actually going to take some of these steps on its own not waiting so this will be one of the main differences when i alluded to earlier like a pandemic era budget this will be one of those where they say uh typically on matters involving the provinces involving expenditures involving some sorts of of shared responsibilities you know for example when you talk about social services like health care uh, when you talk about education these are the businesses of the pro- this is the business of the provinces not necessarily of the federal government outside of funding and establishing some general principles parameters that sort of a thing. Well, this is going to be a little bit different. So say the insiders, and in particular regarding the national $10 a day child care program. So we'll see what that means, and we'll get into that tomorrow morning. Coming up in about 25 minutes, well, we'll call it half an hour from now, very excited to be talking to James T. Arity. He's, uh, if if you read the Wall Street Journal, you know that James is a a Pulitzer Prize winner, first of all, Um, and uh, he's a a China-focused correspondent For the Wall Street Journal, he's been doing some great reporting on the digital yuan. And we were talking about China's digital currency a little bit with Adam O'Brien from Bitcoin. Well, this is you know, going to be a huge story. It is a huge story for many different reasons, from many different angles. And we're looking forward to uh, Mr. Arity joining us. Uh, He's going to be live here in about a half an hour, in about an hour from now. And I have no idea how this conversation is going to go. I'm looking forward to it. I'm very intrigued. A couple of our audience members, a couple of real talkers reached out, prompted by, I think, in, in their email to us, prompted by our conversations around Grace Life Church. Now, I'll phrase this carefully so nobody, you know, sort of misunderstands the point I'm trying to make. Um, but these uh, friends of the show, Peter and Brianna Phipps, reached out and said, you know, you've been talking a lot about churches and influence from church leadership on congregants, like, right, like on community members within the church. They said, we are survivors of a religious cult located just outside Edmonton in Sherwood Park, Alberta. And they said, you know, we've been sharing our story via a blog. This is one that we're going to be taking a look at. Uh, this is uh, Reset-ish. That's the name of the blog that Brianna and Peter have. And they've been telling their story, and they say that many people are astounded and horrified that such a place exists here in Edmonton's backyard. What am I being careful about? Well, I'm not calling Grace Life Church a cult, uh, but what I am saying is that it's it's undeniable, and we had a a listener, an audience member, provide the receipts for us. If you saw Friday's show, you know that. Uh, Was it Thursday or Friday? I think when when we were talking to the Reverend out of Knox United, Greg, a a bit of a blur. That was Friday's show, wasn't it? And uh, Greg Glatz, that that was a heck of an interview from Greg, and uh, he talked about, you know, some of the, um, you know, when you talk about fundamentalism versus evangelicalism, and we got into some interesting angles on that. He talked about white privilege in the church, which is was an interesting one, and I appreciated hearing from some of you real talkers over the weekend uh, using our hashtag, Real Talk RJ, saying, yeah, you know, you know, one listener in particular said, I've, I've listened to that interview with Reverend Glatz a couple of times. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around the white privilege angle. I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> Uh, but I, you know what I jumped out, you know, what jumped out of me there, I thought this, this, this listener is trying to make sense of this, listens to the interview twice, really digging into it. I love that stuff. I love that it's making you think. And just a reminder, you don't have to agree with everything you hear on the show. And we love hearing from, from audience members that are taking things in that appreciate and that really connect with some of the content that you hear here. And, and also love hearing from those of you that say, eh, like this one didn't really resonate and here's why, or or I'd like to hear another angle on this or another perspective, here's why, here's mine, uh, here's a guest I'd love to hear on the show. Those are always, uh, you know, bits of correspondence that catch our attention. You can be in touch with us anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. So Brianna and, and Peter will join us in a little bit less than an hour now to talk about you know, their cult experience, again, not at Grace Life Church. That was just the impetus. That was what prompted them to reach out to us, hearing talk about religion and, and spirituality and church community and pressure from the pulpit. Uh, that was the gist 
That was the theme of that letter that we showed you on Friday from the audience member that used to be at Grace Life that said, look at this. Basically, he fell out of favor. He started challenging church leadership, and they threatened him with things like reading his name in front of the congregation the, the next Sunday morning, that type of intimidation. That's what we were digging into. So this should be a really interesting conversation. It should be a really interesting show. If you subscribe to our Sunday message, our email, our weekly email update, you already know uh, some of the highlights that are coming up later on the show this week. I want to remind you, you can sign up. You can subscribe to our weekly email. Obviously, it's free. Just go to the bottom of the page at ryanjesperson.com, and that's your way to get a bit of a heads up on some of the highlights that we're anticipating in the week to come here on the show. If you support us on Patreon, which you can also do via our website, you already have our top-line report in your inbox waiting for you exclusive to our patreon subscribers that's of course the breakdown uh, the remarkable data analysis that's that's done every sunday by the team at y station they're our official research and strategy partners they take a look at, at what you have told us this week about 950 of you that always blows my mind absolutely amazing just under a thousand of you took the chance to answer our question of the week we asked you about how you feel about grace life church and everything that's going on there right the defiance of the public health orders the fences going up people tearing the fences down the pastor jailed man oh man did we get some great responses from you many of you wearing your hearts on your sleeves many of you coming from positions you know you're in faith communities yourselves and you told us how you feel about this others of you you know agnostic atheists some of you saying my you know my own personal spiritual journey doesn't have anything to do with the way that i feel about the story the story is about law and order um so we'll get into that today we'll take a look at the results of our question of the week and and we want to remind you that that this week's edition of the question of the week is up there on our website as it is every monday morning uh, presented by the team at y station and of course it was a week ago today that we welcomed the family of rob white Rob was the man being hailed and celebrated and remembered as a hero uh, for for putting his own life in peril and ultimately losing his life, rescuing a stranger's dog on the North Saskatchewan River. The response from you, our real talkers, to that interview um, with with Bobby, uh, with Roberta, uh, Rob's wife, and with his two sons, Alliance and Strider, and his friend Chris, they joined us. uh, It was not lost on us. And the emails came pouring in. We know that their GoFundMe uh, saw some some real action. Thank you, Real Talkers, after that interview. And so it, it made us think on and reflect how we show appreciation for the people that we love and how we support people in our community. And so in honor of that and in honor of Rob White and the legacy that he's left, this week's question of the week asks how you can reach out to people around you and, and maybe how we can all do a bit of a better job on that. We also want to take an opportunity to promote that GoFundMe account that's been established to support Rob's family um, to, to you know, take some of the pressures off. Obviously, not all of the stress, but to take some of the pressures off at this very difficult time. So at RyanJesperson.com, you can click to respond to the survey, and then we do link to the GoFundMe as well. We'd love to see well over a 1,000 people respond to this one, and I think we're going to get some amazing and inspirational responses to that. Melissa Cowett. Coming up in just a second to talk about the conservative climate plan. Will it be enough to attract those those teeter totter type voters? The one that go, well, I I wouldn't rule out voting for the conservatives. You know, I live in Vancouver, Burnaby, Port Coquitlam, Toronto, Hamilton, Scarborough. Uh, But, you know, I need to see meaningful climate plan in place. I need to see something that that's feasible and viable and, and, and believable. I mean, could it have a detrimental effect to support for the conservatives on the prairies? And quite frankly, does that really matter? Right. I mean, you know, to use a sports metaphor, if you if you win the hockey game by two goals or or 11 goals, you still win the game. How how much uh, do the conservatives need to need to dominate the prairies at the expense, maybe, of gaining support, of building support in some of the other major urban centers. Melissa and I will dig into that in just a second. Just a reminder as we get set to talk about digital currency today that our presenting sponsor is the team at Bitcoin Well. I feel like it's just like, you know, Paul uh, David Letterman had Paul Schaefer. You know, I'm trying to think of some of the great, like some of the great duos and the, the teams. And oftentimes, if we would have had a studio band, in this case, we'll make it you, Samuel Brooks. The drop of that music bed there was was like you would expect in the, in the highest levels of achievement 
That's like an Emmy Award winning team music bed drop right there. Thank you. I'm I'm uh, I'm quick on the quick on the button. But there. you Thank saw you. the transition coming and you acted definitively and decisively. I love it. It's that kind of a teamwork that we also notice at Bitcoin well. We're in correspondence with them all the time on our business side, yeah, but also personally out of interest, trying to learn more about crypto. That to me is the most beneficial part of the relationship. A lot of people write in and say, well, why Bitcoin well? Like, I can get like ShakePay or some other app, you know, some 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 app that makes it easy for me. ShakePay is not answering your questions. ShakePay is not helping you devise or develop a strategy around financial sovereignty. The team at Bitcoin well can. Check them out under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Budget day today, and we'll learn more about what the federal government, what Justin Trudeau's liberals think Canada needs to recover from this pandemic. And of course, we're going to hear from opposition parties like Aaron O'Toole's Conservative Party of Canada that will no doubt have alternative plans uh, for the, how they would plot the course when it comes to what the federal government will spend on, will invest in. That's the language that everybody will use. Of course, last week, the conservatives were in the spotlight as Aaron O'Toole unveiled his party's climate policy, including a plan to price carbon. Melissa Cowett is uh, vice president of government relations and business development at Canadian Strategy Group. Uh, she's a conservative political strategist, a GR professional. She's been involved in politics in Western Canada for nearly a decade. Kind enough to wake up at the break of dawn to join us live from her home in beautiful Vancouver, B.C. Welcome back to the show, Mel. Thanks so much for having me, Ryan. Yeah. So, th so is it fair to say that in October of 2019, when the Conservatives had, I mean, depending on how you look at it, either encouraging results in the federal election, uh, you know, a ton of votes with a lot of them on the prairies, but a disappointing result, not forming government. Is it fair to say, or would you agree with me that a climate policy was, was identified after the fact as one of the big reasons maybe why Andrew Scheer didn't win that election? I think so. And I think a lot of conservatives would agree with that as well. I mean, Lisa Rayet um, in, in Milton cited that as one of the reasons why she believed she lost her seat. And so I think there was um, pretty broad consensus um, amongst a lot of conservatives that this was something that was needed. This was something that um, was really a lot of Canadians were asking for. And I think in many ways, it's become sort of table stakes for um, large, big tent, modern political parties. So I'm really encouraged to see that Aaron O'Toole took some political leadership on this issue um, and took, um, took a chance, really. Um, he's facing a lot of um, mixed reactions to the plan, um, which I'm sure he expected, but um, very courageous of him. And I'm really glad that the Conservatives are now in the discussion, um, able to talk about this um, and, are, and are part of the, they're at the table. They're having a discussion. I, I liked how Kelly Kreiderman characterized the plan. <laughs> she does a great job in the Globe and Mail. She says, Mr. O'Toole's yeah. climate policy is an imperfect but coherent answer to the climate question, possibly the most difficult policy issue the federal conservative party has to grapple with today. I thought that that was a fair analysis. First of all, can we say uh, imperfect uh, is almost implied in a circumstance like this? Because I'm not sure that anybody from any political party or anybody from any political leaning or perspective is going to agree that a climate policy would assess a climate policy as perfect because so much of it is subjective. So if you were advising the conservatives on putting this plan together, where would you have started? First of all, you have to start with what is recognized as a credible plan. And so they've done that by including carbon pricing um, in their plan. You know, the, their conservatives for a long time have talked about credible climate plans, but have resisted the pricing aspect. And so I think they did a good job by looking at, okay, what, what actually do we need to be doing to be considered um, credible by climate experts, by scientists, um, by economists even? What are the things that we need to be considering to be at the table in a meaningful way? And so I think that they've done that. The second thing that they probably did and will continue to do is consult with who's going to be most adversely affected by these policies. Because even if we agree that 
Uh, climate policy is table stakes in 2021 with carbon pricing. To deny that there are people who are going to be adversely affected with increased taxes. As conservatives, we don't generally like increased taxes as a way to solve problems. Um, we need to look at who are those groups and who are those people who are going to be adversely affected and, and how can we shape policy to make sure that those folks are not left worse off, but still being able to meet some of the goals that a climate plan, um, a climate plan like this would intend to. Melissa, do you, you know, there's, there's no doubt that the conservative, I mean, there's no questioning. There's, there's no argument that the conservatives absolutely dominated and, 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 and not just in this past election. I mean, the prairies, uh, are just painted blue as you evaluate sort of election results. And, and then there are spots where, you know, the, the party knows that it needs to do better, including, you know, Vancouver and Toronto and other areas as well. And pollsters will note that in those major cities, voters, swing voters will say that climate policy could change their mind. This might be oversimplifying the exercise, but but does the party need to consider maybe surrendering a percentage of the vote on the prairies. I'm not talking about losing seats. I'm not talking about dramatic swerves away from the ideology that sort of binds the grassroots together. But but does the party need to be willing to risk some percentage of support on the prairies to grow in the other urban centers, do you think? The short answer is yes. Um, and the math might work in their favor. They might end up picking up more seats in urban areas, as you mentioned, that have um, no, historically not had difficulty voting for the Conservative Party if there aren't things like a climate plan included. So the math might work, but the politics are tricky and they cannot in any way be seen as not caring about any of the support that might um, that might go elsewhere because of this climate plan. They can't just see that as the cost of doing business. They certainly can't communicate that as just collateral damage of needing to win seats in other parts of Canada um, because there are very real national unity issues at play right now. And there are very real east-west issues that continue to exist. And just because you institute a climate plan with climate pricing and are able to pick up seats in other part of the country doesn't mean that you ignore the way in which the people who have historically always voted for you and supported you, how they feel about it. So it's a balancing act. The math might work, but they've got to be careful about the politics with this one. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It, it's been it's been kind of funny to, to see Aaron O'Toole. Um, I guess not. Fi it's just it's it's one of those things where you know words are so supercharged when you talk politics, and the word tax is so supercharged. And so Mr. O'Toole's been trying to argue that that what he would introduce would not qualify as a tax. It would be a levy because because the proceeds, the revenue would not go into government coffers. And it said they create almost these in my words, not his, these these health spending accounts in a way that people could could plug back into green initiatives or initiatives to 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 live a more sustainable life. Is this a thing that's that's worth getting hung up on? I mean, I acknowledge that that Aaron O'Toole has to answer a reporter's questions. He has to be prepared to talk about this, but but splitting hairs over what's a levy and, and what's a tax, is this the type of thing that's that's really going to matter to voters, do you think? Well, one of the things that um, for people who may not be in favor of a carbon tax because of the fact that they don't believe in increasing taxes to solve problems, which is a, a perfectly legitimate point of view to have, it's not necessarily everybody else's point of view, but we live in a, a society where we're allowed to have different views and, and I welcome those. But for those people, I think a huge part of the difficulty with the carbon tax, I mean, in Alberta, the frustration was it being introduced by the NDP without them campaigning on it. And the tension sort of federally is like, we pay this tax, we have increased costs of living, and then we have no idea where this money goes. We have no we have no way of knowing whether, you know, my carbon tax is being used to fund infrastructure projects in parts of Canada that I'll never visit. Um, and we have no sense of like where the money is going. And so I think the, the low, um, the, the accounts are a way to sort of meet those people and have them sort of come to the, the, the table to talk about this. It's like, we're not going to tax you and put your money in a place where you never see it again. We recognize that carbon pricing is something that folks internationally and investors care about. So we're doing that. 
but we're making sure that you know exactly where that money is going. Because that's a huge issue that people who are against the carbon tax for economic reasons and not philosophical ones, that's something that they really struggled with. So I think he's trying to meet them halfway. I think it's part of the design of the imperfectness of the plan. Obviously, those accounts would create a ton of red tape um, and more bureaucracy, which is also sometimes a problem for conservatives. So I think it's going to be a conversation that happens over the next uh, coming days, weeks, months. Um, But it's to sort of not scare off those folks at the beginning, I would say. Yeah, I mean, and I and I agree with what you're saying. And I also think that if Aaron O'Toole was listening to us talk, he'd be like, what do you guys want me to do? Right. Like people are asking for for a plan. So I try to come up with a plan. We say we'll get rid of Trudeau's carbon tax. We got to do something. So I try to do something. And I mean, you know, you're in a bit of a pickle uh, because like like we've said, you've got to establish uh, credibility. uh, And then once it's established, you got to maintain it. You have to have detractors begrudgingly acknowledge that it could be all right. And uh, and I've seen even some, I mean, you know, you know, climate activists uh, commenting over the past number of days saying, you know, pointing out, for example, hey, now every major political party in Canada supports carbon pricing. So in a way, it's kind of brought the conservatives into that conversation and kind of into the fold, which which I perceive to be, in my mind, a, a small win. I perceive that to be, you know, on the positive side of the ledger here, if, if I'm in Aaron O'Toole's camp. And we're, t- you know, we're analyzing what people are saying about it. Now, of course, this has to roll out and people have to believe it and it's got to stand the test of time and, and, and people have to start seeing it as as a good idea. There have been some early critics, like you said, no surprise, all, 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 not all the MPs, but we've heard from several MPs on the prairies that have said, yeah, our inboxes were slammed. Other members of parliament saying we didn't even know the details of this until we read about it on Twitter, until we saw it in the newspaper. Um, some outlets like the, you know, the conservative or the right wing outlet, the post millennial uh, criticized Darren O'Toole for this. They were supportive of his leadership campaign. So that's always an interesting one to watch. And then, of course, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is is, is, is ornery about this one. Does that stuff matter? I mean, if you're if, if you're in in the official opposition leaders office, are you, are you sweating a scathing indictment by the Canadian Taxpayers Federation? Or is this just I mean, you got to be willing to take a few shots. I mean, it's not great news for them. Obviously, those are a lot of their supporters and a lot of people that um, that supported O'Toole that are really the fabric of the Conservative Party. So it's not great news for them, but I think they were definitely going to expect it. I think Aaron O'Toole probably knew that this was going to be um, obviously a highly contentious issue um, and that he was going to take some hits for it. That's why I say it took a lot of courage. But I think um, the reason why I think it matters less now than it would have six months ago is the Supreme Court decision, um, because now there is um, now there is like legal sort of backing for the federal government's ability to do this. And I know, obviously, previously, O'Toole said that he would be repealing the liberal um, carbon tax. But I think that has changed the conversation in many ways, because when we look at how Uh, this impacts people. Like, let's look at industry, for example. Um, Going back and saying, by the way, we're not going to do that anymore after industry has already shifted and um, prepared for this kind of thing is not great. Even consumers, like, I mean, I know obviously nobody is going to say, don't give me more money in my pocket. But, you know, when people shift and they adjust to some of these things, I think they're willing to keep an open mind um, if he looks at other ways in which he can empower the people that have been hardest hit. And I think that'll be critical. And he'll need to be consulting and talking to people about that in order to have solutions that actually work. So I think it's just the start of a really long conversation. But the fact that he's started the conversation is really important. Um, And I know I don't speak on behalf of all conservatives. I'm one member in a party of thousands. And so I know that my view is is just one view. Um, But as a, you know, speaking individually on behalf of myself as a member, I'm really excited about this because it makes it easier um, to get more people involved in the party. And it makes it easier um, for us to to win more seats in in the areas that we need uh, to form government, which I hope we do next time. Uh, you're obviously whip smart communicator. So p- potentially that, or perhaps that's not an accident, what you just said, but it, but it's obviously in my mind, pretty great advertising uh, for the party to be able to say, um, I know I don't speak on behalf of every conservative for every conservative, because there's a whole bunch of different perspectives in the party and not everybody agrees on everything. And that to me is kind of part of the bigger message that needs to get out all over the place. 
right? You know, you, when you when you take a look at some political parties and and you see them defined either by by pundits or by members of the general public as having pretty strict and rigid ideologies. There are so many people, right? I mean, you obviously know this. So many people that can feel like mm-hmm. if they don't fit into that strict, rigid, walled ideology, then they don't have a place in the party. And I mean, the whole premise of this conversation is exactly all about that. And I think also there are so many people who aren't even involved, like never mind the people who are involved in the party right now. There are so many people who are interested in politics, but don't get involved because it's intimidating yeah. or, or they don't, they think they need to agree with absolutely everything in a political party in order to fit in. Um, and, you know, MPs are in a different situation. There's a whole other set in MLAs, of course, there's a whole other set of loyalties that exist. But I think, you know, for, for members and sort of private citizens that are, are looking to get involved and and shape things. You know, I I say this all the time, but it doesn't matter what political party, but get involved in something. I think people are really, um, people that have never been involved in politics are really unaware of actually how much of a difference you can have if you sign up and and vote in leadership elections and on policy issues. And so I hope that this encourages um, more people to get involved in the conservative party because I think that there are so many great things about the party and I, it's why I'm a member and support them. Um, and this is just another great step in the right direction. And hopefully as all political parties do, we continue to evolve and we continue to, um, to look at, what context we're in, what issues are facing and adapt and adjust and not be married to um, one way of doing things. What's one thing that you're, that you're looking for or keeping an eye on or curious to see uh, with regards to today's budget that, that'll be put in front of Canadians by the finance minister, Christian Freeland. Well, there have been so many promises made by the feds with respect to infrastructure spending, social program spending. I'm really interested to see in what kinds of, Um, infrastructure projects across the country and particularly in Western Canada that they choose to support. Um, There's obviously been a lot of provinces that, or sorry, a lot of promises that um, investment in green infrastructure will be something that they focus on. I'm really curious as to how they do that while sort of not overstepping provinces and not sort of um, getting themselves into situations where they're overreaching, um, but also supporting that, um, that recovery that so many Canadians across the country are hoping for and, and that need. So hopefully those big infrastructure spends will um, create lots of jobs. Um, a little nervous about the debt um, for sure and the spending and, and hopefully they have a, some kind of a plan on how they will get out of that at some point. Um, I'm not holding my breath for that, but I think that would be really prudent. We're going to be spending right now. Here's how we're going to get out of it in the next number of years. So that's what I'll be watching for. This is a this is a more sort of esoteric uh, approach to budgeting, which is not a, the quality that you want with a finance minister. I'll acknowledge you want them to have sharp pencils all the time and be very detailed. But I, I sort of think it's it, and I agree with you. Obviously, people want to see a path. We used to talk, you know, paths to balance. Remember that right now it's kind of like. You know, we have to say we'd like to see some sort of an inclination of maybe when you kind of sort of might start to make our way out of this. It's completely different ball game, but but it is interesting, isn't it, to see how Canadians have had to wrap their minds around numbers, spending, debt, deficit, obviously through through twenty twenty through this pandemic that would just be unfathomable at any other time in, in human history, right? I mean, I mean that's that's just the way it is. When you're talking about, you know, blowing over a budget by th- whatever it is. I shouldn't throw numbers out. I don't have them in front of me, but let's say $350 million over. Uh, wow. But just such a different time. Such a different time. And I think people, um, so again, me speaking as a member of the Conservative Party, I'm okay with some deficits right now. But again, where's the plan yeah. to pay it off? Where's the plan to invest in things just like you would in your personal life, not to compare personal and uh, government budgets, because that's something I don't like to do. But, you know, what are we investing in that's going to make us money in the future that's going to help create jobs and not just sort of like hamster wheel spending that we can never get out of? Um, And it's actually not creating greater uh, productivity um, or getting more people involved in the labor force. So I guess that's another thing. It'll be interesting to see what they do with a childcare um, child care plan, if any, because that one is one that so many people, um, I think most people agree that something needs to be in place, but there are so many different views on exactly what the best solution to it is. But um, yeah, that'll be, that'll be another thing I'm watching for, for sure. Melissa Cowett is a VP uh, out of Vancouver for Canadian Strategy Group. Always appreciate your perspective on the show. Thanks for waking up early for us. 
Thanks, Ryan. Take care. Uh, on the, our live chat, it's interesting to see some of the, some of the comments here. Uh, you know, Michelle says the fact that you can only get a rebate with this climate plan if you spend. Uh, that's the way they want it. Uh, that's a no to me, says Michelle. Erica says Aaron O'Toole is a supporter of women's reproductive health, saying he'll never reopen the abortion debate, and now he has a climate plan. Erica says, I'm listening. Okay. Well, that's an interesting perspective. I think that's I think that's all if you're advising O'Toole or if you're Mr. O'Toole himself, I think I think you'd be happy with that assessment to this point. We're not we're not going to the polls yet. Right? The writ's not dropped yet. I know a lot of people are still expecting that to happen in short order, but but that's not where we're at right now. So I think that Erica's feedback that she's listening would be an encouragement to that party. And then some of you were saying, hey, listen, it's a hard no for me. And there you go. That's your perspective. We're going to talk, of course, about the federal budget in 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 more depth tomorrow. We can actually sink our teeth into it. We've got a great roundtable coming up. That'll go live at 9 a.m. Mountain, 11 o'clock Eastern on tomorrow's show. I wanted to give a shout out uh, right now to the team at Sherwood Park and St. Albert Dodge. We know that they had a busy weekend uh, both at their dealerships where there's plenty of space to walk out on the big lots and take a look. Uh, get that fresh air in. Take a look at the 2021 Jeep lineup. See it all up close and personal, including that Grand Wagoneer. Some of you, including Don, I love this, out of Strathcona County over the weekend. He snap, He sent me the first snap, the first photo that they've seen of the new Grand Wagoneer in person. He says, you know, we've all been seeing him on the tracks, the long lens, the spy photos, if you will, of this highly anticipated return, this luxury SUV. Well, he saw one in a driveway and he sent the photo. He hashtagged it to Real Talk RJ, which we appreciated. You can take a look at it yourself in person at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge, Alberta's best Jeep selection. Also, a big shout out to the team at Park Power. You know, if you go to parkpower.ca right now and use the promo code 2021-RealTalk, they're going to knock 70 bucks off your first bill, no strings attached. They're in the electricity, natural gas, and internet game. They do uh, residential and commercial and they'd love your business to bring you on board with the the, the idea the commitment they have their community commitment where 10 percent of their proceeds go back into nonprofits. it's one of the big reasons why we're proud to partner with park power before we talk to james arity wall street journal let's take a quick look at what's making news on this monday morning As mentioned, the first budget Canadians will see in about two years expected to focus on uh, shoring up pandemic supports and then laying the groundwork for sustainable growth. A big part of that is going to be what's rumored to be a $10 a day federal child care program. Finance Minister Christian Freeland will deliver the first uh, budget in more than two years later this afternoon while keeping the federal deficit. So say sources talking to the CBC under the 400 billion mark. Uh, the child care announcement, they say, will not be about expert panels or, or undertaking further studies or, or, or entirely subject to negotiating with the provinces. They say the federal government's going to move it through because it plays into one of their three key budget components, which include introducing measures that address critical needs in the short, medium, and long term. The Toronto Star also reporting today that the feds will roll out a $12 billion extension to the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, as well as the Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy and Lockdown Support Programs. Also, look for wage and rent subsidies that will run through till September with a heavy focus on small and medium-sized business, including incentives on either hiring new workers or increasing the hours of existing employees. Also worth noting, Ontario and Alberta both are making announcements, and we'll see more details a little later on this afternoon, relating to the AstraZeneca vaccine. Ontario and then Alberta on Sunday, both lowering the age for who's eligible for that to those 40 and under. The AstraZeneca vaccine previously only available to those under 55. Of course, this amid mounting pressure to expand eligibility for that shot as the third wave of COVID-19 is really taking its toll in regions of Canada, including obviously Ontario. Ontario is appealing to other provinces, as you know, including Alberta, B.C., Quebec for health care workers. Alberta, meantime, currently has the highest rate of active COVID-19 cases in the country. 
Well, a few days ago on the show, we we spent some time talking to Adam O'Brien, the founder and CEO of Bitcoin. Well, we check in with Adam from time to time when we want to talk crypto. We want to talk about stories in the news, including digital currencies. And how are you going to talk about cyber currency, digital currency, without taking a look at what's going on in China right now as China creates its own digital currency uh, it's the first for a major economy, and and James Arity has been covering this as a China-focused correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he, he the guy spent like almost twenty years in Shanghai for the Wall Street Journal. He's been reporting from Hong Kong through most of the nineteen nineties. He was a joint winner of the two thousand seven Pulitzer Prize for international reporting and the twenty ten Overseas Press Club of America's Malcolm. Forbes Award. It's a real pleasure to welcome James Arity to the show. Thanks and welcome to Real Talk. Thanks, Ryan. Nice to see you. James, this this is a story I know you've been following for a while, this digital currency out of China. Can you can you lay the groundwork for us on, on what has led to this and what you think is is motivating China to take this step? Uh, should we talk about what a digital currency is? You Great mentioned idea. Uh, a digital yuan is. Um, you mentioned Bitcoin. Uh, this is not Bitcoin. This is uh, it's a quite a different endeavor. Bitcoin is a decentralized, uh, you know, you know, who's in control kind of currency. This is a it's a, it's ri- it's run by algorithms. Whereas what China is trying to do is China is making taking its paper money and it's going to digitize it. It is going to make its currency. Uh, the regular currency that that's flowing around the paper money the coins into digital form uh, so it'll look sort of like bitcoin but it'll work very differently um, and that's because it's in the hands of the chinese government the, specifically the central bank the people's bank of china they'll be in control is that is that kind of part of what you think is motivating it I mean, if you take a look at what some people might identify as the advantage of crypto or the advantage of Bitcoin, that that anonymity that comes with it, when you take a look at this, the potential for monitoring or control, do you think that's what's driving the Chinese here? I think that control is um, is is very important to the leadership in China in in all realms, and that includes the digital realm. I mean, we can see it in the way that the internet is controlled in China, um, and this uh, currency when it is digitized, will permit the central bank to do all sorts of things um, in that, that, it, it, under, the, under the guise of control. Uh, control in the sense of they will be able to monitor each and every transaction. They'll be able to see where every, let's call it the dollar bill of uh, each yuan is at any moment in time. They'll be able to see how it's being spent or not spent, uh, saved. But They'll also be able to control um, uh, when it's spent. They can uh, program this like any kind of computer uh, device. It could be programmed to uh, make it easier to spend, say, on refrigerators instead of uh, alcohol. Uh, they could uh, they could penalize certain people who uh, were were in trouble and and not allow them to spend money. And on the other hand, if there were some kind of natural disaster, they could send a bunch of it to victims, uh, you know, with a snap of a finger or a punch of a keyboard. James, do you think and in that context, what you just talked about, can can you see this, uh, you know, becoming a, a player, I guess, when in the context of international use? I mean, when we look at the role that the U.S. dollar plays internationally and has I guess since World War II, or maybe even before then, what what impact do you think this will have internationally? It it seems the biggest questions about the digital yuan are whether it will have uh, in uh, have a a role internationally. Um, clearly, China would like its yuan to be internationally used. This is the second biggest economy in the world, and its econ- and its currency isn't really used much outside China. Uh, the you know the U.S. dollar is king, as we all know that. The fact is that makes China a little uncomfortable, more than a little uncomfortable. And this is one element in trying to internationalize, drum up interest in the in the digital yuan. There's a lot of debate about how easily that would be for, uh, you know, whether 
by making it digital, that'll make it more acceptable to the rest of the world. In some ways, it'll make it much more difficult because you'll need to have the technical um, sort of connections with China in order to get it, in order to spend it. Uh, so in some ways, it'll be very difficult for it to move around. China says that this is about the domestic economy. It's about retail sales. It's about you know, money spent by individuals in small quantities. And it's only an iteration from what China already has. We're familiar in the West with uh, Apple Pay and lots of ways to pay electronically, even credit cards. It seems like money doesn't actually exist. In China, uh, they're, they're sort of light years ahead on this. Um, the, the payments are so digitized that it won't make much of a difference at the retail level, whether they can go to the bank and get their currency out in paper money or in digital form because people aren't really ever touching paper money in China already these days. But it's, it, it is a development that draws new attention to the Chinese currency and makes it seem more modern in ways that are discomforting to central bankers, uh, not only in the United States, but in, in many Western countries, partly because everyone can see things are getting more digital. I mean, your music is digital, uh, your movies are digital. So why wouldn't money eventually become a digital product too uh, in the same way? So everyone can see sort of the direction that this will one day be a digitized world, even for money. And China has, is a step ahead, it seems. So uh, that's a big international implication. James, you uh, in your reporting, in one of your recent pieces uh, for the Wall Street Journal, uh, you, you talked to Josh Lipsky, uh, formerly of the IMF, uh, now at the Atlantic Council think tank. And, and one of his quotes that you included in your feature jumped out at me. He said, anything that threatens the U.S. dollar is a national security issue. This threatens the dollar over the long term. Is this a national security issue, do you think, for the Americans, or at least might they be perceiving it as this at this point? I think that you need to at least first put the emphasis on, on the long term um, that, he, that he said there, that Josh said there. Uh, it is a national security concern in the sense that uh, if – the world becomes more digitized and currencies are one of the ways the world is more digitized and China has one and the US doesn't, uh, that there's no digital dollar, um, you know, does that make the dollar less appealing in some ways? Uh, a lot of what we see is not that, a lot of the power that the US has with the dollar is that central banks around the world invest in it. Uh, and, they inv and, and they invest in U.S. Treasury bonds. Digitizing the Chinese yuan will not make it a reserve currency held by central banks. It won't, you know, it, that won't happen automatically. Um, but it, it, if digital solutions are one way of getting money to poor people, people who are uh, unbanked, don't have a bank account, aren't really connected to the economy in some way, uh, and but do have a mobile phone, it's possible that as the global economy grows, that the digital yuan will ha will find a home in places that in the past might have used a U.S. dollar. So I don't think this is a national security. I don't think anyone is saying this national security alarm right now, but it is something to be concerned with. And with the dollar as such an important element of what it is to be uh, uh, the world superpower, um, anything that challenges that is, a, is something that should be uh, considered and, and watched. And the Fed, the U.S. Federal Reserve, is watching this. It is watching China. How do you think, like when you look into your crystal ball after digging into this story and, and just you know using your powers of observation, how do you see things changing with regards to people's spending habits, uh, people's saving habits, people's, you know, expectations of, of uh, privacy with regards to their personal financial transactions, not just Chinese citizens, but as stories like this continue to, to shape our opinions or our understandings of, of transactions and currency and trade and economies, um, 10 years from now, how different do you think the average person's habits 
will be than they might be today? Well, I, having spent so much time in China, uh, which is so far ahead in, in digital, in the digital universe, it's hard not to imagine um, that, you know, a lot of the things that we see there will come to the West. It happens more slowly, but it works. Um, they work here in, in the West, uh, in these payment systems. And I, I think that uh, I'm not sure I have any crystal ball, but I do have the luxury of having lived in China for a long time. And I can see that how things get developed there very rapidly without the same kind of public debate that, there, there would ha that we, we would have in the West. Um, and then they, they arrive in, uh, in the Western countries. You know, one simple example is shared bicycles. Uh, shared bicycles were around in China for a number of years. And wow, this seemed like a great idea. You would, you just pay a very, very little amount of money and then you can pick up a bike practically anywhere and ride it for a little while and drop it off somewhere else. And, uh, and, and you don't really care which bike it is. You don't have a favorite bike. When I was a kid, I had a favorite bike. Today, I don't care which bike I, I use. Um, and, but in Western countries now, we see shared bikes become sort of part of the fabric and nobody even bats an eyelash. And I think that these things, this seems so outlandish, um, like a digital currency become uh, the norm. And I think it will become the norm in China. It's hard to imagine that won't also happen here. We see so much digitization of our life. We see now artwork being digitized, yeah. people making literally millions of dollars on uh, uh, a shot of a, a, a basketball um, uh, rebound or something like that is somehow digitized and made and, and sold for lots of money. You know, it, 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 there's no going back, right? I mean, digital, uh, we have a digital future. Yeah, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around all that stuff. We, we, we've covered that to, to just in the very shallow end of, of how people are now collecting art and, and these video clips, like you said, and it's just it's hard to wrap your mind around. Um, the, the, we've got some really interesting comments uh, on our live chat right now. For the folks that are watching us live on YouTube today, uh, if you're just tuning in live on our Mixler audio app, we're talking to James Arity. Uh, of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this is, uh, you know, Mark is watching in from Utah. He says, I rarely use cash anymore. Uh, Scott says, no cash means no black markets, which is both good and bad. <laughs> uh, another says, uh, Colette says, I use cash way less now with COVID. I, I prefer to tap my phone, tap a card. Um, others are saying, you know, James says, I can't remember the last time I used cash, maybe once or twice since COVID started. James always have like, you know, a, a bill or two, like a banknote or two, who calls them banknotes? You know what I mean? A little bit of cash folded up in my wallet, but it honestly hasn't moved. I haven't touched it in months. And Heidi writes in to say, you know, she always has a little bit of cash. She says, once you've been through like a, a blackout or a power failure, some sort of a crisis, um, you know, you, you never make that mistake twice being left without any cash. But really... Isn't it funny to think, I mean, our little guy, five-year-old son has a coin collection. I mean, that's, <laughs> I say to him now, I'm kind of like, help yourself to the coins. Like, I, it's not like I'm carrying any around anymore. This is a dramatic transformation. And as you've written about, I mean, the Chinese were kind of at the forefront of it way back when money was all coins and they went to paper. They've done this before. Yes. Um, you know, but I think that it, it's easy to think that we don't have any cash in circulation right now because because you're not touching it every day and because you are paying with your phone. But at the end of the day, those are just ways of moving the money around. You could go to the bank and you could get out the cash. But what, Ch what China is talking about is uh, you can't go to the bank and get money out. You can only go to the bank and get um, uh, a digital form of the currency. And if you carry this very far into the future, maybe you don't even need a bank um, because the, many of the transactions, instead of being processed by the bank, actually get processed by the central bank, by the government. And it's a, it, it adds all sorts of uh, complexities to the way that we look at things. So, yes, and, and, and you know, the acceptance of, uh, of paying by your phone and these things that seem, make it seem like money doesn't exist make it seem to me more likely that digital currency will be something that takes off in the future. 
James, you've got you you've got such a, an a, an amazing and intimate understanding of of Chinese culture and and um, obviously having spent so much of your career um, writing uh, from that perspective, I, I I know you'll get at what I'm like when I, when I take a look at at how Westerners in particular perceive China. Oftentimes, it seems like they invoke the name of the country, and and along with it comes this implication of so many things. Let me give you an example. So when we're talking to people about TikTok, you know, the social media platform, sure. and or whether we're talking about like Huawei or 5G or whatever, we can have all these types of conversations. And, and I'll say to someone, hey, are you on TikTok? I was trying to decide, should I be on TikTok? And I said, are you on TikTok? And somebody said, no, it's owned by the Chinese. And it's kind of like, Okay, well, why would that concern you? Ah, and then the conversation doesn't really go much further than that. There's just this kind of, I'm not saying with everybody, but there seems to be sort of an inherent hesitation around anything that may be owned by the Chinese. We hear the same conversation. You know where you're talking to me. I mean, here we are in Alberta, you know, the Alberta oil sands, Canada's energy capital, so to speak. The Chinese have made huge investments in the oil sands, the oil and gas industry. And and a lot of times, even the reporting on that, people say, "Ah, that's been sold to the Chinese. And people kind of go, okay. Is that a fair assessment? Are, are people right to be somewhat somewhat leery about the Chinese government, the way that it operates, the impact it may have on global politics, global economies, and the like? Or, or have you seen a different side of it? Or do you think you might have a different interpretation of it based on your, your decades' worth of reporting? China is a, is a super complex place. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, it does have the most people in the world, 1.3 or 1.4 billion people. And so there are nuances to everything. And, and every sort of idea is, is alive there in the way that it would be in any Western country. Um, their government is extremely different from a Western government. And, uh, and you could say that their culture, their history is different because it's so centralized. Um, and it's, it's not a democratically run place. Uh, and so, and, and, but it's also just not a well understood place. I think that it's quite eye opening and revealing for anyone to go to China, just like it's eye opening to go to practically, you know, any other country or even another city. You do, you do see things differently when you when you visit a place and, um, you know, every one of the suspicions that people have about China, you know, you can certainly find evidence to support uh, all, you know, anything nefarious, uh, but you can also support, you know, a much more complex uh, viewpoint by, by having, by visiting. And, you know, it's, it's not any easier to sum up China than it would be to sum up the United States. Uh, it's, it's, it's partly, uh, I think it's very important to try to understand what's going on in China because it is different. And it's, it's sometimes easy to, uh, look at something you don't understand. And, you know, it's hard, it's hard to understand. And, and I can't say that after living in China for many years that I understand it a whole lot better than I did when I first arrived because it is a complex place. But I think you could probably say the same thing about the United States or, or practically anywhere else. It's a, it's, it's complex. Yeah. I, I think that's a great observation. You know, it's kind of funny when, you, when you're talking about the population of China and you say, you know, what is it like 1.3, 1.4 billion. And I, and I think of the, the flex room there, the leeway is about a hundred million, which is about <laughs> right. three times the population of Canada. Right. <laughs> so it gives you a little the bit number, of perspective. The numbers are astounding in China. The numbers of anything, anything that they ha- that they do in China, it's very important. It's, it's just big numbers. Yeah. In closing, James, um, you know, the Beijing, obviously, well, China will, will host the world again uh, in February uh, with the Winter Olympics. And, and, geez, I mean, we could we could hit this from a million angles. Some countries are talking about boycotts. A lot of people are wondering what will be the state of the global pandemic at that time. There's the digital yuan implications here as, as a potential for, for China to roll out some of, of the applications there at the Winter Olympic Games. Is there is there one storyline or is there one angle that, that you're sort of keenly monitoring or monitoring with interest within the context of the Olympic Games coming up next February? 
Uh, I mean, let's stick to the digital yuan. I think that, you know, everyone's going to watch the, the games. Everyone's going to watch the skiers and skaters on, uh, on television competing. And I think that we're going to see probably shots of people, athletes, uh, superstars, gold medal winners using their phone to pay for something with a digital currency. And I think that that is going to be a big stage for uh, this development. And I, I think it bears watching. James Erty is uh, a Pulitzer Prize winner and a China focused correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. I've been reading your work for a long time, and it's it's really great to have you here on the show, James. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, Ryan. Nice to hear from you. You bet. You can read James' work again, of course, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, and you can follow him on Twitter. Uh, we tag the handles, the Twitter handles for all of our guests every morning from my account at Ryan Jesperson. And we, we encourage you to, to dig uh, into some of the work that they're doing, including James' great reporting um, he and I have actually been, been corresponding for a couple of weeks now, maybe even a few weeks, uh, planning uh, his, his time here on the show. And so we appreciate him doing that. Uh, I loved reading some of the comments from you on the live chat. This live chat is just uh, blows my mind some morning. So many of you engaged on this. Kim makes a great point. She says, one of my kids' bank cards. When we talk about people's spending habits and digital currency. I know this is not technically digital currency, but, but it's an interesting point on how we spend. Kim says, one of my kids' bank cards stopped working. And she didn't need it for six weeks. She managed on Apple Pay for that long. I hate to, to uh, Sam, ex- expose how uh, lazy or negligent I can be in some areas of my life. But I've, I've had some interruptions on some of my payment platforms uh, with regards to like I had a certain window of time to reset a pin. I didn't reset the pin in time. Now I got to go back. It's a bit of a pain. Follow up, set the time, make it, to, you know, yada, yada, yada. And so I've just left it. And, and much like one of Kim's kids there, she writes in, I've been managing on Apple Pay and Tap for, like I would say, weeks without having access to a card that I should definitely probably have access to. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird how that happens. I remember very vividly, like even just, you know, you think about um, where we are with digital currency and like last January, so like January of 2020 before the world exploded. Uh, I was in the UK for a bit and I remember like getting on a bus in Liverpool and I could just tap my phone and it didn't matter what bank I was with. It didn't matter where I was from. I could just pay by tapping my phone. I would just pay fair and it recorded my transfer. Just boom. Yeah, yeah, just boom. And it's just like you kind of feel like we're really far behind as soon as you have an experience like that. But see here. So you said and it recorded your transfer, which is really convenient for you. But for somebody that's trying to move around under the radar where they could drop a few coins into the collector well, well, then bin you, on the, the bus. Then you put your coins in the collector bin on the bus and you sit at the back with your tinfoil hat on and it's just fine. <laughs> your tinfoil hat or your balaclava. Oh, there, there, could, you there could be several reasons why you're... Sarah Hoyles is uh, watching or listening in this morning and she makes a great point. She says credit cards aren't available to everybody. Vulnerable people don't have access Will digital currencies be accessible to all folks or will it leave certain people out? That's a great question and it's a great point. One of the things that one of the angles that people are taking here as an advantage to digital currencies like the digital yuan is is saying that that, you know, for example, uh, people without means in poorer countries, uh, this would be advantageous to them to transfer money. Uh, some of the barriers would be removed there. Others are saying that it would allow some countries to work around sanctions, uh, which if you're from the U.S. or even Canada, you may not see that as a positive, to say the very least. I also wanted to point something out, Sam. Um, Sarah Mack is uh, listening in this morning, and um, she she jumped in. You and I were kind of workshopping uh, one of our uh, plans for tomorrow from, from 9 to 10 Mountain. So from 11 to noon Eastern tomorrow, we'll be talking about the federal budget. It drops later today. Finance Minister Christian Freeland, our panel, will get into that tomorrow. And then after that, it's April 20th. It's 420. And it's it's a day of, I suppose, celebration and recognition and focus from the cannabis enthusiasts around the world. And it always has been. Although I kind of feel like 420 these days is, is a little bit different, can, especially in Canada, considering that cannabis from a recreational perspective is legalized. So 420, not so much a protest. Um, as it is now maybe more of a celebration. Uh, so we started with the, the, the which you identified, which I agree with you, is an, an admittedly somewhat of a stumbly, an ironically stumbly title, the, the, what would we call it, the, 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 the 420 Puff Puff Pass Real Talk Roundtable. Yeah. 
And then it's, we it's, it's too many words. It's too many words, but it's kind of fun because you yeah. watch somebody like you know three hoots in try to say it, and it might be kind of fun to watch. Um, <laughs> and, and then I think we got to the the puff puff pass panel, which then evolved maybe into the puff puff panel. Yeah, see, quick, short alliteration. I love it now. But Sarah Mack is watching. Oh boy, and she says, "Boys, it's a joint committee." Oh yes. <laughs> So Sarah Mack on that one. Very well done. We're going to be getting into some of your comments. Uh, you can keep them coming. We're keeping an eye on our hashtag Real Talk RJ. This is a great opportunity to remind you that, you know, I check uh, the live chat here on my MacBook Pro and I check the hashtag Real Talk RJ on my iPad and I'm checking messages that are coming into talk at ryanjesperson.com, our email inbox on my iPhone and all of these are made possible by our great partners at Westworld Computers. We've had a couple listeners reach out in the last little while letting us know that you took advantage of their lineup of the gently pre-owned gear whether it's a tablet or, or an Apple Watch or whatever if you don't want to spend the full ticket but you want to get banged for your buck they've got some gently pre-owned gear there that has all the software reloaded they've been wiped everything's secure and it can wind up with somebody else's medical records on your new computer uh, and then they also reapply the warranty, which is really great for a lot of people working with a limited budget. You can find that in all their details by following the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. Just look for Westworld Computers. Also, big shout out to the team at Grand Dog Essentials. Uh, you know that our dogs, Moses and Monroe, enjoy their quality raw food. You know what I enjoy? I enjoy the fact that it's dropped off at our front door. And they'll do that for anybody that's in Edmonton, Calgary, or Central Alberta. Just go to granddog.ca. That's where you can also connect with their nutritionists that'll help you find the best solution for your dog's nutrition routine. And if you use the promo code REALTALK at granddog.ca, they'll take 10% off your first order. Also, big shout out to the team at Eden Landscaping. You know, we're already dreaming about the plans we have for our outdoor space this year. We're going to try to hit the backyard full bore and do something really special back there because, well, it's just, it's boring. And quite frankly, I'm getting sick of all the grass. I'm getting sick of the grass. When you have two dogs trying to keep real grass green, ay ay ay. So we're flirting with some different ideas and we're doing it in consultation with the team at Eden Landscaping. If you want to see the amazing work they can do check out landscapeedmonton.ca i wanted to read this letter before we move on this is from jackie um we're not going to say what what church jackie's a pastor at because when, when she signed this letter off she said please don't use uh she's a pastor she said please don't use my church's name uh ryan if you are going to read this email these lovely people don't need any haters this year and so we said okay jackie okay we we won't name the church but this is this is a great email that we received over the weekend the subject line on grace life church and just all of it that's the subject line writes pastor jackie can you imagine let me offer this as a, a quick summary first. For those of you, I don't want to take this for granted. If, if, you're, if you're, you know, you're listening in from New Zealand, this is your first time discovering the podcast. Real quick, Grace Life Church is a church just west of Edmonton, Alberta. That's where we come to you live from every weekday morning. And and there's long story short, they've defied public health orders relating to the pandemic. They've said, forget about the 15 percent of fire code capacity. We're gathering in full. Packed to the rafters every Sunday. That is until Alberta Health Services and the RCMP put a big fence up around the church. Oh, and their pastor did a month in jail for refusing to follow the rules, too. They're now still gathering in secret, in defiance, and they say that it's them following their faith. They say it's an important element of their freedom of religion, so to speak. That's the backstory. Writes Pastor Jackie, can you imagine Thinking that following Jesus, the one who literally chose to suffer with the world for the world, means that you deliberately choose to not suffer with your neighbors, though something affects the whole world. Deliberately choosing not to demonstrate love to your neighbors by sacrificing some of your own privilege around mobility and shopping and gathering in large groups for their sake. Can you imagine people who say they follow Jesus thinking they're above the situation we are all in, thinking that their rights to not have to make a single change for the sake of a neighbor is what trumps everything else. And then telling people that you are being persecuted as a pastor, writes Jackie. I just want to say that so many Christians are appalled at this, appalled 
The Christian church has in no way been shut down. Our rights to trust God, read the Bible, cultivate community have in no way been persecuted or taken away. All that has happened is that we've been asked to love our neighbors as ourselves and to take reasonable measures to protect one another. We can still meet, and yeah, it's different, and yeah, it's been hard, but we're resilient and we're created. We're not persecuted. The stance this church has taken, many of us believers are at a loss as to why. You know, the underlying theologies that churches like this have are based on incredibly poor Bible work and historical work, and that's directly related to who is and who is not allowed to do biblical interpretation and tell their stories. This has misshapen an understanding of the very God who we claim has created us all in his image. Good God, writes Pastor Jackie, this makes me so upset. How dare they take this incredibly beautiful good news and make it so gross. We are called to love one another, to love as we have been loved, to love others as we love ourselves, full stop. That's the fulfillment of the law and every morality. Admittedly, this is hard when war is a force that gives us meaning, as journalist Chris Hedges has written. I am susceptible to slipping over the line that enjoys too much taking down my enemies, and for that I hold myself in humility and accountability in community. I know I don't know it all or see everything truly, but I also know Jesus was way harder on the teachers and religious leaders. Jesus was never mad at them for being too gracious or too compassionate or too aligned with the poorest and most marginalized. He did get very mad, like flipping tables mad, at those who made so many rules and hoarded power and got in the way of people being made whole. I have no idea what culture war these folks think they're fighting. Christian artist Makoto Fujimura writes that culture is not a territory to be won or lost, but a resource we are called to steward with care. Culture is a garden to be cultivated. What on earth? are the people at Grace Life Church cultivating? But then I have to always pause here and ask, what kind of culture am I cultivating? And that's a productive question. Regardless, I should stop. I've got a Sunday morning service to prepare for and maybe a bit of heart work to do. Thanks to Real Talk for letting us hear these conversations and allowing us to contribute. And then Pastor Jackie says, oh, and P.S., I just wanted to say that I went to music school for my undergraduate degree with Daniel Bartholomew Poyser at the University of Calgary. You remember we had him, the the star, the, the feature, the focus of Disruptor Conductor, that CBC Gem documentary. He was on the show. If you didn't see that interview, you have to watch it. She says, well, he wouldn't remember me. I have a distinct memory of him seeing me in the hallway when I was in some sort of a 19-year-old state of distress and him stopping to ask if I was okay and if I needed anything. Watching his career unfold has been an absolute delight to so many people who had the chance to cross paths with him. That from Pastor Jackie. I love that email. Thanks so much. We always want to know, I mean, th- we see it every day, don't we, Sam? I mean, you get the emails too when, when it goes to talk at ryanjesperson.com, how we, we may have an interview or we may talk about something, and I think that's going to include the conversation we're about to have here, where audience members will take so many different things from the same conversation. And I thought that that was amazing from Pastor Jackie. Our conversations about Grace Life Church... And there you see, talk at ryanjesperson.com. That's the best way to email us. And of course, use the hashtag RealTalkRJ if you're on Twitter. That hashtag powered by Park Power. Brianna and Peter Phipps reached out to us last week. They heard that we were talking about Grace Life Church and and, and talking about the, the powers of, of persuasion or coercion, of intimidation, you might call it that we've seen from inside that church a remarkable email with receipts, with signed letters from that church leadership from an audience member last week, and we brought that to you on the show. Brianna and Peter wrote to us and said, we're, we're survivors of a religious cult right here in Alberta. We began to share our story via a blog six months ago, and as word spreads, wrote Brianna, so many people are astounded and horrified that such a place exists here in Edmonton's backyard. The blog that we're talking about, you can see it yourself at reset-ish.org. 
dot com at reset dash ish dot com. The authors of that and the courageous individuals behind it are Brianna and Peter Phipps. who We're proud to welcome to the show this morning. A good morning to the both of you. Thanks for being here. Good morning. We have to lean in. <laughs> yeah, you guys hey, you get nice and close together and, and Sam will work his magic, too. Uh, so you've got I notice you've got you got an, an, a nice, shiny uh, microphone there, a new microphone. And I, I guess that's probably because you're also getting set to launch a podcast uh, coming up in just a couple of weeks, aren't you? Yes, we are. Yeah, this yeah, has uh, this has been I, I'm going to get I'm going to get out of your way here because I'm I'm I'm. Uh, so interested in what you have to say. This has been part of your journey. Um, the blog, the podcast, all of it about your, can I say escape from what you're characterizing as a cult? Uh, Brianna, how did this all begin? Take us into it. Okay. So, um, my husband and I, we were born and raised, um, inside of this cult. And three years ago, um, a situation happened with my husband regarding his business that he was running at the time. And um, instead of coming to us to help us out with what had happened, um, our, they turned their backs on us and they kicked us out of the cult. And we received a phone call and basically were told by an elder of the church that the Bible says not to make fellowship with a wrongdoer. And because of what had happened, they claimed that we were wrongdoers and said, you're not welcome back to have fellowship in our church anymore. So, Peter, it's safe to say that that nobody that's in a cult would ever call it a cult. Um, so what characterizes this as a cult? First of all, who are we talking about? And why do you say with such confidence that it's a cult? Uh for us, what we define as a cult is basically uh, you're held there by conviction that you, you know, if you if you're not within their four walls, you're going to be kicked out, or you're going to be going to hell. Uh, there's no life outside of what they believe, and the way that they structure their whole system, where there's you know there's three elders and then there's a pastor. And the pastor is ultimately the one who makes the decision on who comes and goes. And those decisions are based on your financial input to the church, uh, very foremostly. Um, and overall, your uh, attendance to the church. We would go uh, two, day, two, two services on Sunday. Uh, there would be a men's prayer meeting on Tuesday. And then there would be a service on either a Wednesday or, or a uh, Thursday evening. So um, I guess when you... When it comes to calling it a cult, uh, the, I would go and say the abuse that happens there. Yeah. Um, there has been criminal activity that has been kept within their fall wall, four walls and not brought to the law. Um, fear, paralyzing fear, um, brainwashing those that attend, saying that anything outside of what they preach and what they talk about is going to kill you. You will not survive. Um, I have received hate mail from members that still go calling me. Um, I'm wearing it on my shirt actually, but delusional, full blown, crazy sociopath, um, just full on hate for everything that everything we're telling is lies. They just don't want anything that we have to say to get out to the public. Brianna, is this, are we talking about, like, I don't want to take anything for granted, and, and people are going to listen to this interview, qu quite frankly, all around the world, so I don't want to assume right. that anybody's familiar with what we're talking about. Some people might picture a cult like, you know, the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas with a compound. Uh, some people, right. I, I mean, are, is this a church where people return to their homes and, and attend the services at a physical church building? Yes. Can, can you describe it for us? Okay, yeah, so they all like they have they have jobs in the outside world like they they live in our neighborhoods like they don't live on a compound now um your children are not allowed to go to any public or private school they have their own building on their premise that your children go to you're not allowed to um, put your children into the public or private school system um, but other than that, no, they, you, they have lives, like they go to the grocery store, they do all that kind of stuff, but your life has to be revolved around what they believe in. Um, like you can't, I mean, I, I wrote in my email to you 
the way that you dress, the way that you, you look, your hair, your, if you have piercings, tattoos, like everything that you do in your life is dictated to you by what their rules are. Now they don't call it rules. They call it a way of life. This is, uh, my understanding, uh, this church, the teachings of this church, is part of it's it's part of a group called the Message, uh, yes. And and this is all based on the teachings of Prophet William Branham, right? I, I did some, I did correct. I did some reading on on William Branham <laughs> over the weekend to prepare to talk to you, um, and, and I dove deep into your blog. By the way, your writing is unbelievable. I want to get to that in just a little bit. How about you guys are your <laughs> Thank heart? You. Well, your hearts are on your sleeves. I mean, it's yes. a, it's amazing the stuff that you're writing about, and and it is full transparency. Um, but but you talk to me. I mean, and in and in some of our correspondence over the weekend, you, you know, you describe this as a front for racism. I mean, the Ku Klux Klan for abuse. Absolutely. I mean, these are major allegations that you're making, and and obviously the fact that you grew up in this, um, this is your personal experience. What do you mean by that? A front for racism in the KKK? William Branham did not speak highly of um, black people, especially black women. Um, they are, there are a few um, black women in the church that we came from and they are not allowed to get married. Um, they are not allowed to do things that if you are white, that you are allowed to do. And we were told that it was such a sacrifice to God that they were making to be a part of it by sacrificing their life and living who they are. Um, William Branham had some really awful things to say about um, black people. Um, the cult that we came from, they, the behind it is William Branham, but the focus has become more of the pastor. So as I said, this is called the message, but even the cult that we came from is a cult within the message cult. We were known as like on our own tree on our, like totally separate from the message. We didn't even associate ourselves with the other message churches. We were taught that we were better than them, that we had, it was just, we had it better. And we were like taught to hate the others and all of that kind of stuff. So we were known and I've even reconnected with some that have left the other message churches and we're like, we've heard about you and you guys were doing your own thing. So it was, comes down to the pastor of the church has created his own rules, his own way of life and is pushing it upon his members. What's what what sort of rules are we talking about that would supersede or that, that, that would elevate the commitment beyond what other churches in, in that same fold or other churches following the teachings of that same uh, so-called prophet? What sort of things would we be talking about? Well, I, I would say, you know, it, it controls every aspect of your life, right? From what would make it different is, for example, I grew up on the south side of uh, Edmonton in Mill Woods, and uh, I remember just growing up there and from a young age around, you know, six years old or whenever I could, you know, as far back as I could remember, we were always, you know, always told not to play with the other kids in the neighborhood, you know, don't, you know, don't be playing with them at the parks, you know, but stay away from, you know, stay away from everybody else outside of the church. I, I would say it comes down to excommunication. That too, yeah. You know, when you leave, so when we were kicked out, my oldest son was in the kindergarten uh, in the school on their premise. And the very next day, he was not allowed to return. Like we were excommunicated. We were on the chopping block. His, all of his belongings from the school were dropped off in a garbage bag on our doorstep. Um, we have no relationship with any of our family that still remains. I mean, I have been called every name in the book because of what I'm doing and sharing our story. Um, the abuse that goes on differentiates, uh, from others. Um, we've, I mean, you've read my blog and being vulnerable, like we've done it to our son, but we did it because that's all we knew and we knew it was right. And after being kicked out, I started educating myself. And to be honest, I went onto a mom's website, what to expect. And there was a open worldwide community and just hearing the different input from other women on different things from parenthood to child raising to religion to just everyday life it was 
my mind was blown. I was like, I told my husband, I said, I have to start from the ground up. I don't know anything about anything. And that's when we decided to write the blog and share our story. They don't believe in mental health. And I think that's a huge one. Um, we are starting our own mental health journey and they just think that it started because a woman fell in the garden and it's craziness. And as you know, from our blog, we're starting on our own journey um, with depression and anxiety from all the abuse, especially that my husband has endured and being able to stop this happening to our children and especially our oldest, he's nine and having these conversations with him because he remembers a little bit and being vulnerable and saying, you know, what we did was absolutely wrong. Hmm. You know, we know you remember, but yeah. You have an absolutely beautiful family. Five, Thank you. five kids. Um, yes. You sent us a photo of them. We want to put this up so people can see. I would, I would imagine. I mean, look at that family. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. um, Thank but, you. But I mean, you talk about your journey, and it, it's re, it's remarkable. I mean, you saying that that you know you have so much to learn, and you've got a lot of things to figure out. And and these are have kind of been the the defining principles of of the way that you two have lived your lives for for what like more than twenty five years, right? Um, yeah, twenty six years. Twenty six years, and then and then at the same time, you have to communicate with your kids, especially if you're oldest. What mm-hmm. what may have been a potentially traumatic um, experience? Do you? Mm-hmm have supports i mean and you reference you know that you've lost contact with a lot of your family members are we talking immediate family after being excommunicated yes. from this community yes yes immediate family yes we have been so are you are you do you have a support circle or are you building a support circle or where are you drawing your strength in this journey that that like you said is almost starting from scratch for well <laughs> the community of Sherwood Park since starting my blog and from Edmonton have come out in droves and I've never had support like this in my life. Um, my own parents were kicked out of the church as well. Um, my mom has been a great support system for me um, as she also is starts her own journey. Um, some ex members have also reached out and I've reconnected with some of them and we've shared stories and we've talked about our experiences and they've been strength behind me as well. And, come out when I get hate and support me. Um, Most importantly, it's been my husband. Honestly, it's, if it wasn't for him, I, I don't know if I would be where I am today. We, he has been there and we've talked everything out. We've three months after we left, you know, just, he sat down with me and he said, just tell me a thought that's Brianna's. And I never have had just a Brianna thought. And I was like, I don't have one. And he said, I want you just to tell me something that's from your heart. And that's where this all began. And so since that point in time, just the support has come out mainly from the community, something that was never there. A lot of a lot of ex members as as well. Yeah, there have been a lot of ex members that have left throughout the years and they've all in a way just sort of banded together and, and we formed a little Facebook group and started started a little community on that. And, uh, From there, it's been really great as far as support goes. uh, I mean, for the equal amount of support we we have, I think we've so far got the equal amount of uh, hate. Hate. (laughs) Well, and I would imagine that it's so important, probably from from your perspective, to be able to uh, speak with people that have an understanding uh, of of you know what you've come from, right, and what your experience has been. Because for a lot of people, this wouldn't be the type of thing that that they could relate to, right? I mean, this is this is this this, this is the type of community that has shaped and and almost in a way controlled. It sounds like every element of your life since you were Absolutely. kids, right? Absolutely. Well, and I think this is where it started from. Is when the first time I put my our son into the into the school system, I went to a parent teacher meeting. And a mom reached out and she was like, oh, hey, you know, we'd love to have you over. Our boys are some our friends. And I was like, okay. And I was nervous. And then they were like, so what's your background? Where do you come from? And we started telling them about the cult. And they just stared at us like deer in the headlights. And to us, because we lived it, we're numb to it. And that's how I describe it. And they were like, you need to write a book. And I was like, no way. You know, this is just nothing. You know, they were like, no, to all of us out here, this is just pure insane. 
And I was like, oh, okay. And then more and more people kept telling us that they kept telling, you know, little bits and pieces here and there. They're like, you need to write something. You need to do something. So we were driving back from his extended family that we've um, reconnected with after leaving. And he was like, what do we have to lose? So we drank a little liquid courage that, you know, we weren't allowed to drink all these years. So we drank a, a glass or two and we were like, we have nothing to lose. We came upstairs, hit the publish button and the rest is history. Well, it's it's amazing. And, and I want to get into some of the things that, that you write about. Um, sure. you, you write about money, um, mm-hmm. personal relationships. You write about sex. Uh, you're mm-hmm. writing about body image, brainwashing. I mean, it's it is all out there. Uh, and I would imagine there, there's probably a cathartic element to it. This is pro- probably, Absolutely. you know, and you're, and you're finding solidarity. I mean, we're seeing on our live chat right now, when you go back and watch this later, you can read the live chat in real time <laughs> okay. when you watch the video. You'll see. I mean, people are saying right now, how can I re- how can we reach out to these people? How can we connect with these people? Um, oh, I, I, I want to acknowledge that we're, we're talking to Brianna and Peter Phipps. Their blog is reset-ish.com. reset dash ish. Dot com. Am I reading that right? Is that is that like when I say that we're going to get to the news headlines on on this podcast live, and I say it'll be around nine o'clock ish, which which could be any time between <laughs> yeah. eight fifty and and ten o'clock? Is 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 it what what does reset ish mean? Well, we were thinking about names. I d- we we like the word reset, but I didn't like the whole word reset. I liked reset ish ish in a way because. We, I don't like the word when we talk about mental health either that we want to fix people. I think we have, I have things from there, from just being me, that I'm able to rebuild myself and restructure myself with some strong foundations that I've always had within me that I just was not allowed to show. You can't be your authentic self. And I think that's my message is when you come out of this, there's so much fear, you know, there have been suicides because people just can't, they're so in your head and they just feel like they can't move on with their life. And my message is that if you've come from religious trauma and cults, there is a life outside of this, you know, so you can take those pieces that you have of yourself that you weren't allowed to show or be, and you can rebuild and you can structure something of yourself. Reset reset ish (laughs) (laughs) and you can live the most full life that you were always meant to live i want to read some of these uh comments here on our live chat uh listener here um amber says this sounds a lot like the church i grew up in word of life tabernacle in sherwood park Um, Judy says, this is unbelievable to me that people embrace this lifestyle. Why, uh, want to get to that in just a second. Um, Chris says, you know, that threat of isolation, the idea of excommunication, the threat of isolation is very, very powerful. Michaela says, my best friend growing up, grew up in this church, and this is really hard for me to listen to. Thank you both for coming forward. Linda Ray just says this courageous couple, and then she's got a big heart there. Uh, Carla Howitt, a former counselor out in Strathcona County um, and a really engaged citizen. Carla Carla is amazing. Uh, Carla says it's really hard to believe that this is happening in in Sherwood Park behind the scenes. Um, Carla, uh, a different Carla, Carla Brown says shunning and excommunication defends the doctrine of purity. Uh, I know purity doctrine, that's the type of thing that 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 is going to I mean, geez, if you bring that up in faith circles, people can talk about that for hours um, Brianna, what's the application here, the idea of, of, of the so-called purity culture and, and the impact or the influence that that would have had on your lives, including getting married and, and having kids at a relatively young age? Um, so growing up and then by the between the ages of five and 16, you don't have any relationship with the opposite the men and women girls and boys you just don't you don't have friendships you're segregated from each other when you turn 16 you're allowed into something called the young people's group and all of a sudden you have girls and boys who have never been able to talk about sex or anything and they're coming into a group and the main purpose of this group is to find your spouse in but there's only a few so like when I turned 16 I think there was five of us and and my husband included so there's five of you and you have to choose you have to find your spouse within 
this young people group, but you have to stay six inches apart. You can't touch every date you go on. You have to have a chaperone. Now you're 16, you're 17, you're 18, you're 19, you're a children, but in the cult, you feel like you're old, you're wise, you have, you know, you just, you grow up to get married. That's your main goal in life. And to start to have children, birth control is, you know, talked against unless you get permission from the pastor himself. Um, it had been said, you know, if you get married with not having the purpose to have children, you don't get married. So we started dating when we were late 17, dated until a year. And then four months later, we got married. And three months after that, we had our first child. But as you read in my blog, as the cult preaches, you know, no premarital sex, no nothing. Well, we did being honest and vulnerable. Um, our lives were falling apart, our home lives, and he was my safe space. And I, one thing led to another. Now we kept it a secret because we knew that if anybody found out, we would have been, you know, kicked out, excommunicated. And at that young age, it's really hard with knowing that if you step out into the world, you're going to, you know, burn into a pile of ashes. Um, but it's, it's preached, it's, you know, purity, purity, purity. And then you get married and all of a sudden, I remember driving away from our wedding. It was just the two of us. And I was like, this feels wrong on so many levels. <laughs> we went to a, a hotel and we went in the hospital into the elevator and we looked at each other and we're like, is this allowed? Is this okay? Like, what are we doing? And then you, you get married and then, you know, you start having sex, but I knew nothing about it. I didn't know anything about my body. I didn't know what it all was about. And he taught me and then I educated myself via Google <laughs> and all these things. And this is what they put on their, their children. And it's, it's so toxic. It's detrimental and you go into it and it's, it's hard on a marriage when you get married at such a young age, you go through so much, but you can't get divorced. So you just got to make it through. I have, I have an email here from, from a listener that says respectfully, it, it, it's striking to me or, or it appears as though these two are hesitant to name the actual church and to name the actual pastor. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, is, is this fear of intimidation or repercussions? Uh, repercussions i would well i guess just the fact of slander i don't want i am um, these people will go to great lengths to to ruin your life and if i say names or if i name the actual church i i fear what will come so i as i've on my blog as you can see i'm very careful not to mention anything because I don't want anything to come to, to me or my family, even coming on to your, your show. This is the biggest thing that has ever happened. I mean, I'm just shaking because I know that the hate mail is going to come in. I mean, we live in Shore Park. They live in Shore Park and, you know, we're, we're preparing ourselves. So it's, it is, there is that fear there. Yes. We I had a, a a listener who's also a personal friend of mine who reached out and, and she requested anonymity, which, of course, I would grant. And, and she indicated concern for the two of you for doing this interview. Um, mm -hmm. She said she's familiar with this community um, for, for reasons that I won't say, but intimately familiar with this community. Um, have you experienced uh, significant uh, threats to yourselves or, or blowback after being, I mean, you, you described to us the, the, the process of being excommunicated. In other words, you were kicked out. Mm -hmm. Now, now you may describe that ultimately, I suppose, looking back as a blessing. Uh, it, 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 it led to your reset ish. And, and now, yes. now, now you're sort of, here's, here's life 2.0. Um, yes. but, but with regards to things like, I mean, you, you touched on, uh, to me personally off, off camera, social media spying, intimidation, mm -hmm. bullying. Can, mm -hmm. For our audience members, can, can you explain to us what life has been like in the three years since you got out? Uh, it's, <laughs> been, it's been wild. Uh, I, since the day we left, well, sorry, kicked out. Since the day we were kicked out, I remember, uh, to be completely honest, I, I shut down for a whole year. I didn't do anything. I, I stayed home. My wife carried my ass for a whole year. I was, I was in a really low spot, but just with everything and the way that it went down, this, uh, this caused me to cut off all my ties with my own parents and my brother. And, uh, 
it, it was a huge shock. We lost our whole support system that we had, or at least we thought we had. Um, and uh, so I shut down for a whole year. And uh, honestly, it was really hard on, on Brianna uh, personally uh, and myself. And we could see it in our kids. It was really hard on them. So I would say right around getting into the second year, we finally started opening up a little bit more to people around us and, and uh, building better friendships with uh, people that had never been inside of the church and getting to know them because our whole life we were taught that outside of the four walls, there's no such thing as a good person. Uh, I remember hearing that right out of the pastor's mouth. Uh, there's no such thing as a good person outside of this that doesn't believe this. And that's what I personally struggled with a lot and and finally overcame. I, I made a few really close friends that I've opened up to and shared my life with a bit more. And I've just seen a lot more support and a lot more support than I thought I was going to get. And that was just such a big surprise to, to me and to Brianna. Um, I mean, since uh, since we've been gone, yeah, we, and we, we've explored so many things. <laughs> yeah, like life has been incredible. I, I describe it as we've basically become children again. We are experiencing life as children. You know, we are able to go down to white out without feeling that we're going to, you know, be condemned to hell for just, you know, going and stepping on there. Or a bowling alley. A bowling alley, listening to music. Music has been incredible. I mean, ACDC, let's rock out. You know, everything has been, you know, just Southern gospel and movies were not allowed. I mean, a few Disney's, a few this, but you know, Hollywood is totally preached against. We couldn't have Netflix. YouTube was, you know, very limited. We were, you know, it was preach. We couldn't even have Pinterest. You know, you couldn't even scroll through. Sorry, <laughs> one of our dogs. It's totally okay. That's great. With it, you, you know, I was going to say we're a family-friendly show. Not always, but that we're friendly to families. <laughs> there, there's a difference. So we love it. We love interruptions from little ones, cats, dogs. You have it. Family members of all sorts. Who's this delightful little one? This is Kate. Kate, what a cutie! And how old is Kate? She is three. So Kate. So Kate joined us on planet earth right around the same time that, that mom and dad were experiencing sort of a rebirth of their own. Yeah. <laughs> yes, she did. Um, but yeah, as you touched on spies, so what is happening is that these members are creating fake profiles on Instagram and Facebook and in email form and blasting me and calling me all sorts of names, telling me to move on and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, you know, if you don't want to, if you have something to say to me, stop hiding behind your, your fake names. Like just, just come to me, just, you know, out yourselves and I'll talk to you and I will, I will tell you what's happening in our life, but they all hide. You know, I've had some that have created like actual, like fake names and have tried to befriend me, trying to get me to say things so they can use it against me. Yeah. It's been, it's been quite a ride. So Brianna, why are, why are you doing it? If, if, if someone from this community were to say, you know, just, just leave it, just move on. And we can understand why they may want that. Um, and, and if they were to ask you sincerely, why are you doing this? Why are you doing the blog? Why do you have, let me, let me show your Instagram here. And, um, I want, I want to talk about this post in particular in, in just a second, but, but you put all out there on your Instagram as well. And, and Sam, can you put it up on the screen where you can see B underscore, is that rough? B rough? Is that how you say it? Are you PH? B roof. B roof. B underscore yes. roof. Um, yes. and, and you're putting it all out there very personally, your, your, your innermost thoughts on your Instagram. If someone were to say to you from this community, why are you doing this? Or, or why are you doing this to us? What might you say? I'm not doing it to them. I'm sharing my story and I just hope that I can help just one person begin to live their true authentic self. And I'm no, I don't want, I harm or anything to come of them but they took my life away from me. I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that being there, that I, I wasn't able to be 100% who I meant to be. And so I'm doing it, I'm sharing my story and not just for that particular cult, but for anyone who's been in a cult or suffered religious trauma to know that there is life outside of this, that you can have an incredible life. You can do things with your life and you won't be struck by lightning. And, you know, there have been parents, you know, when we left, my husband was kicked out three times. The first time he was kicked out, his relative in there 
told me, he said, I don't even classify him as my son anymore. Jeez. And he, we've had, there have been members, they will pray that we will die so we don't have to go through the tribulation. If we, if you leave or you're kicked out. I'm just going to step away for two minutes here. Sure, Peter, come back at your convenience. Uh, they will, yeah, they will pray and they will tell you, they'll say, well, we hope you die so you don't have to go through the tribulation. And that is traumatic on anybody. Yeah. I've got this message. Um, I don't know if you know Kathleen Smith. Uh, if you're on Twitter, you probably do at Kiki Planet. She's just an absolute beauty. Um, she's taking in the interview this morning. She says it occurs to me, uh, listening to Peter and Brianna, that that their experience parallels my own experience, says Kathleen, in the Mormon Church so very closely. She says even mainstream religions engage in cult-like practices and enforcement of behaviors. She mm-hmm. says, I empathize with their trauma and their rebirth. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are connecting with what you have to say. I think even when you talk about religious trauma, I've had mm-hmm. so many conversations with people that have, that have grown up in different churches, different denominations. You might describe them as different religions uh, right. that may have common threads. And that were that things that were inherently them, um, mm-hmm. you know, the one that immediately comes to mind is being LGBTQ, right? right. Um, it, for a lot of people, it doesn't matter what religion you were in. It was traumatic growing up mm-hmm. in that context. For other people, it may have been a, a faith healing background or, or it may have been, um, you know, the, the sort of the family dynamic or how they saw it. I, I, we got an email that maybe I'll make time for later. That someone talking about the role that, that they always perceived women to have in the church or to not have. Oh, absolutely. And how that shaped their, shaped their perspective as a woman. Mm-hmm. It, it seems like that. You really connected with that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so gender roles are very, are, are taught, right? And I still, and that's why I am actually for myself seeking therapy because even in my own life now, there are things that I do. I mean, I talk about it on the blog and one that sticks out is um, I was living with um, an elder and his family and I had a basket of laundry left on my bed and I was told that it was unbecoming of a woman who was about to be married to leave a basket of laundry on her bed. So even now that when I have laundry and I have seven people in my family, we have laundry, I mean, here, there and everywhere. And I still hear that voice in my head telling me that I'm becoming of a, it's unbecoming of a woman to have this, to have my laundry in a basket, um, to have supper on the table, you know, when my husband walks through the door, that it's my job to cook, clean, and raise the children. It's the husband's job to go out there and provide for his family. And we were told that if, you know, the man doesn't provide for his family, then he doesn't eat. His family doesn't eat. Um, so these gender roles, you know, they are stuck in my head. And this is something that I'm going to therapy for to to get help and to how I can overcome this because sometimes it it brings me down. It, you know, it overcomes me. So let, let me ask you how, how much it took for you or how significant it was for you to put this photo up on your Instagram. Uh, as I might say, if I were, if I were 95 years old, bearing your midriff, uh, <laughs> and, and you, you write when my past is screaming slut and whore in my head, as I wear this outfit, I push through those thoughts and I scream out, I am a powerhouse, I am strong, I am beautiful, I am a hot mama, I am bold, I am influential, I am change, and I am sexy. Uh, I am. What did it, how, how big is it to have you post something like that publicly, considering what you just told us? It's life-changing. And I don't say that word just all the time. It. I have three daughters and to have them see me do these things and to let them know that as a woman, I am not here to be sexualized. Just because you see my midriff does not mean that I owe you anything. I don't need to hide under my clothes to make you comfortable. I am free to be me. I can be, uh, uh, I have the audacity to do it. And when I do it, I just, an overwhelming feeling of pride comes over me. Actually, my nine-year-old son took that photo of me. <laughs> and as he was taking it, he looked at me and said, Mom, he said, you look beautiful. Aww. And just to hear my son and my girls 
say this. I just know that I'm making a difference in their life, something that I was never allowed to be. You know, those teen years that are so important into finding yourself and, you know, experiencing experimenting with all different types of things. We never had the opportunity to do that. So I know they say when lots of people leave or are kicked out, you know, we could become rebellious. No, we're not rebellious. We're finding ourselves. We're, we're reaching, we're finding out who we are, we're really meant to be. And so posting that photo, like, that's me. I have a tattoo. I have a nose piercing. I have earrings. And this is me. And that, and so when I see that photo and all the comments, I'm like, yeah, I am, I am all those things. And it's just a life changing, powerful thing for me to do. You know, it's when I saw that photo, I, I just thought that is, it's, uh, it's such kind of a normal photo for so many people mm-hmm. to, to put on their Instagram. There, there's mm-hmm, there's right. really nothing unusual about it um, right. in, in the context of what we see on social media. But for you, it's yeah. huge, right? It, it, it's huge. Like it is, those words are playing in my head because that's what they call me. Mm. I am a slut. I'm a whore. I'm all these things. And, and, you know, we were told because of who I am, you know, our marriage wouldn't last six months after we left. And here we are just celebrated 10 years together. And the way I dress does not define me. A piece of fabric does not make me who I am. It's an art expression for me. And so when I post something like that, it is a monumental statement. It is, like I said, life changing. Peter, you you described your year, your first year out um, as a difficult one for you. And, and I think that, that people would have, I, I don't think that we need to be able uh, to completely understand your life experience to understand why that might be the case. Uh, I, th- I, th- I think that it's, it's remarkable that the two of you are here within three years, I think, which is a relatively, in my mind, a short period of time uh, to be able to look back with such insight and such perspective and to be able to talk about this like you do. Um, I want I want to ask you a very personal question, and I hope you don't mind. But but what has this experience done to your faith journey? Do you have a faith journey outside of the parameters of this community? Uh, no, I, I think um, for me, very personally, I coming out of it, I feel like if you, I don't believe in God. To put to put it very frank I, I just I can't I, I uh, I've done my own research and I'm not I don't claim to be some <laughs> you know profound you know, educated person I, I just uh, I do a little bit of research and, and I believe in science you know I, I believe that if you can prove certain things and science proves that, that you know there's a sun in the sky and this is why there's a sun in the sky uh, and it's been here for a million years and, and it, you compare it to the Bible you know, it just, God created the sun. So I, I just, I don't, I can't mm-hmm. believe that. It's more of a science-based thing for me. I, I, I can't believe the Bible. I know that, you know, if you do believe in it, you do believe in God. I don't, uh, I don't judge you for that. I came out of 26 years of it. And, uh, uh, you know, everyone has their own belief system. But for me, I, I think part of becoming a, a good person or being a a better human being could mean doing a little bit more of a spiritual introspective, doing an introspective look at yourself, at your spirituality. Um, I would say that that I believe more in being spiritual than being religious, but I wouldn't say that uh, there's a God, but that's just me. (laughs) That's where I'm at. And that's, that took a lot to get, to get to uh, and thankfully a lot of the friends that i have have, have uh, actually come out of the cult as well and talk to me about their experiences and what brought them to their conclusion as to why they think you know that there, there can't be a god there's just no way uh but again that's just my opinion <laughs> well i'll tell you I, um a while ago now we celebrated a buddy's 40th birthday uh outside around a campfire and the campfire started, I think, about 8 o'clock at night, if I remember correctly. And um, there were a couple guys there from Pentecostal Assemblies of God and a couple guys there from Christian Missionary Alliance, a um, guy with a Catholic background, a couple agnostics. And uh, we started getting into spiritual, not religious. 
And uh, long story short, let's just say we saw the sunrise and nobody slept that <laughs> night. Uh, exactly. I, it, it was literally uh, about a 10 hour conversation. We didn't solve wow. anything. Um, right. But it was a wonderful exercise, and 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 I can and I can relate to the journey of wrapping your mind around trying to understand that. Uh, Brianna, are you on are you on your own journey a, a, alongside Peter, or or I mean, I, you, I mean, faith is such a personal thing. Um, how would you answer that same question? Um, I'm an atheist. Hmm. <laughs> I don't believe in God. There is just way too much damage done. Um, my friend and I joke about we believe in the flying teapot. <laughs> um, I just, the God that was taught and shoved down our throats to make us do what we had to do and the way we had to live our life, I just cannot believe in him. I just, it, I can't. Um, if, and I've read on my blog, like, if there is a God, I'm not there on my own personal journey. I, I like my husband, am more of a spiritual. I believe in the effects of the moon and astrology, those types of things. And to be honest, they have come true this month for us. <laughs> but um, in the sense of religion, I will, n- I will never step a foot back into it. Mm. I just, I can't, I can't do it. You uh, alleged uh, near the beginning of our conversation today that you you believe or that you you know you say you've witnessed criminal activity uh, mm-hmm. that that's occurred within this community. You, you've alleged that that there have been measures taken to to hush people, uh, so to speak. Um, do you see your response to this exit or your personal journey uh, leading to advocacy uh, for people that may be? victims of alleged crime? Are there any steps that you're considering along those lines? I mean, a lot of people right now that are watching this, they're listening to this, are having a hard time wrapping their minds around the fact that if all of this is true, if what you say is true, that there are people that are continuing uh, to be subjected to this type of intimidation or this type of behavior, this type of reality, what does the future look like on that front for you? Well, actually, um, a listener wrote in, uh, Carla Brown, I think you said her name is. Mm. Um, we've talked um, and we are planning, hopefully, to get together. My goal is to one day have a safe haven, you know, a shelter of some sort, that when people do leave um, religious cults and are suffering from trauma and have nowhere to go if they are excommunicated, to create a place for them to come, a safe place, a safe haven, and we can help them get on their feet and start enjoying life that's my long-term goal. That's where I want to get this to. Um, I don't know if it's in the near future or, you know, the far future, but if anyone wants to work with me, but that's, that's my goal because I know for ourselves when we left, we had nobody. It was just me and him and we have done this on our own. It's, and it's hard. <laughs> well, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, when, when I would say, yeah, it's hard, I, I, I don't even know where to begin to try to understand. Uh, but I'm so grateful that the two of you have shown, I mean, you'll see, you'll see on the live comments, and I'm just waiting, you'll see what's going to happen this afternoon when this podcast goes out. Um, right. And when thousands of people start to listen to this, I have no doubt that people using the hashtag RealTalkRJ are, are going to have a lot to say about this and their own personal experiences and, and, and what it's doing with regards to enlightening them on some of the things that are going on. Before I thank you for your time, because I know you have a family of five beautiful and wonderful children that are probably missing mom and dad and ready for life to get back to normal in, in the Phipps house, uh, is there anything that we've not touched on today that you would regret not saying while you have this audience so captive have we missed any important points um i think we've covered lots of points um i think it's just the main is the control of it all um the money i mean i've you've seen on my instagram i made a post about you know having to pay 15 percent of any increase that comes into your home is mandatory before you pay your bills before you put food on your family's table there were many times where we had an empty pantry an empty fridge and they we were just told we had little faith and if we just had faith money would show up in the mailbox 
Um, I was a young mom, 23, and had three kids. We lived in a one bedroom apartment. My husband was bringing home $2,200 a month. And I was suffering from postpartum depression. I didn't know it. Um, and we had planned to go away on a holiday and the leadership got word of that. And we were hauled into a meeting and we were told that they had looked into their tithe and offering book and saw that the amount we had paid didn't add up to like six months worth. And they said that if we went on this trip, we would not be allowed back the next service. But if we took that money and paid it back to God, because essentially we had stolen from God, we would be allowed to walk through the doors the following Sunday. So I left there. I threw an adult tantrum. I've never screamed like that in my life. I cried. I, I hit my bed and I just said, this can't be right. But we paid it back anyways. And that's why you see $1,500. We put together every penny we had to pay it back. We didn't have food. So my mom, she wasn't in the church and I had been excommunicated from her. I called her and she answered right away. And she was like, what's wrong? Cause she knew. And I said, mom, I have no food in my fridge. I have no food in my pantry. I have no formula for my babies. And she said, meet me at Superstore in 10 minutes. And she did a huge grocery shop for us. And I have, I'm forever grateful that she did that for us to this day. Yeah, people are going to wonder about this this photo we're showing on on your Instagram. So that the T and the O is tithe and offering. I, I've never yes. I've never heard of a church where those are two separate budget lines, where tithe is one <laughs> and offering is another. I've always heard tithe and offering is one. But you were saying, just so I'm correct, you're looking at this budget. You said, did you say your family was making about twenty, bringing home twenty nine hundred a month? Twenty two hundred. Twenty two hundred, and your tithe and offering commitment was fifteen hundred. Is that right? So it that this particular budget was a catch up month. So taking 2200 so and a child tax that would come in. So any increase. So when you get paid, it has to be paid on your gross income, not your net. And then so anything that you sell or anything, you have to pay 15%. So this particular month, because we were behind, we hadn't paid because our, we were drowning in life and bills. We just we weren't making it. And we were, they looked at the books. They were like, your amount you've paid so far doesn't add up. So it looks like you owe this and this and this. So we had to play catch up. So we were paying big lump sums, every penny we could find to put it in there before our bills are, I say on there, our electricity has been cut off more than once. I guess, I guess this is where I really want to put one little plug <laughs> that just irked me was I remember sitting in one of these particular services and the topic was money. And as much as he says, you know, he hates talking about money and he hates that he has to bring this up every once in a while, somewhere in that service, I remember sitting and watching him talk. And I, he said, he said, before you pay anything, you pay this tithe and offering. And I'll let you know the 10% is actually dedicated to the pastor the five percent would be dedicated to the operating of the building and bills and all stuff like that but the words that came out of his mouth were even if your children go hungry you need to pay the this tithe and offering and that was sort of a click moment and that was maybe a year before we, we were actually kicked out but yeah that's that's something that just irked me and i couldn't wrap my head around that no matter what We've got audience members that are saying we would love to be involved in what they're doing. Um, we'd love to support them. Y'all, you are brave. Uh, please be safe. Um, we are listening. We hear you. We're just signing up for your blog. Um, I mean, I mean, it's really remarkable here. Um, the best place for people to connect with the two of you, I would imagine, is via your website. I mean, obviously, they can follow you on Instagram at b underscore roof r u p h, and then at reset dash ish.com is, is that probably that's probably the main hub hey brianna um the website and instagram instagram i am very active on my instagram trying to grow it trying to make awareness of all of this and the website it's my husband's done lots of work on it um you can ask questions you can reach out to us on there you can support us on there um if you want to connect with me um my dms and my instagram are open i mean i'm i'm welcome to all sorts of conversations yeah, that's very evident. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm blown away by the two of you, and I'm so grateful Thank that you. you reached out. Uh, you never know. I mean, if if one person 
that needs to hear this interview uh, is able to access this and and start on their own journey, uh, it will be worth it. But I suspect that the impact will be far greater than that. Uh, Peter and Brianna Phipps, thank you so much, first of all, for being such engaged members of this audience, for being fans thank of Real you. Talk. I'm a fan of what you're doing. We'll look forward to your podcast coming out next month um, at the yeah. beginning of May. What's it called? Have you decided? Uh, reset ish. <laughs> reset ish. Okay, good oh, stuff. Well, yeah. well, hey, I guarantee you, you're going to find a whole bunch of subscribers from from this uh, engaged podcast audience. Thanks for making time for us today. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you so much. Wow, what a dynamic duo! What a beautiful family, the Phipps family, and and my thanks to them for joining us and displaying what I think is absolutely great courage. Um. Gordon says, I've thought about, uh, if I remember correctly, I think Gordon lives up. Is it Slave Lake? Pardon me, or Lac Labiche? Gordon lives somewhere beautiful. That's all I know. Somewhere beautiful north of Edmonton. Uh, Gordon, my apologies. But he says, I've thought about doing a recovering from religion support retreat here at my resort. That from Gordon. Isn't that interesting? Um, I, I'm going to acknowledge something else here. Some people are saying if they want to help name the church. Um Listen, I think that they, they've gave, they've given a very compelling explanation as to why they're not specifically naming the church, but I think that you can find other clues in the live chat here from other people, and I think it's pretty obvious, and you can do basic Google searches. You can Google the name of the prophet that we discussed, William Branham. You can localize your research, and it's not that hard to find, um, but I certainly respect their desire to—we I, 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 can't imagine the type of abuse— that people encounter in their own personal lives. And I suspect that you could see it. Could you see it on Peter's face a little bit? When, when Brianna would bring up a couple of things you could see is he kind of winces a little bit. And, and obviously, I mean, three years out of this, uh, that's still just the beginning, right? So many of your St. Colette says, what, what amazing people. Gordon followed up Slave Lake. That's right. Thanks very much, Gordon, for listening in from Slave Lake. A shout out, by the way, to Moose, who chimed in earlier when I said, you know, people around the world are going to hear this interview. Moose was listening in live from Perth, Western Australia. How great is that? Real talk um, all around the world here right now. We're always so grateful uh, for those of you that chime in. Speaking of religion and faith and community, we're going to get into the results of our question of the week presented by Y Station in just a little bit. Wanted to take a quick second to remind you the team at Friesen Brothers is eager for you to come. Uh, your next grocery shopping outing, your next adventure. If you've not yet been into the new Friesen Brothers store in South Edmonton, just off the Henday at Rabbit Hill Road, do yourself a favor. I don't even care where you're coming in from. 90 minutes, a couple hours of drive from Edmonton. You say that doesn't matter. It'll be worth the drive. Trust me. Last week, I was talking to you about their amazing Alberta honey feature. I was talking about Banja's Smokehouse where they do those braised beef short ribs. And of course, I've told you about that Montreal smoked tofu as well. Just a really neat take on tofu. Well, today I want to focus on the Alberta produce and the Alberta veg. I mean, they have been supporting Alberta producers in so many different ways at Friesen Brothers for decades, for more than 60 years. And you'll find the freshest produce grown by Alberta producers at Friesen Brothers, 15 locations across Alberta. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. The team of the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want to remind you, and so did some real talkers last week, that they have dairy-free options when it comes to some of their all-time favorites, including the Dilly Bar. Now, if you're like me, you have an insatiable curiosity. You need to, well, contrast and compare. So why not pick up a dairy-free Dilly Bar, one of the original Dilly Bars, and, I don't know, conduct a bit of an experiment. Or is that maybe just how my mind works? Either way, they'll be have thrilled to see you. two hands for a reason. Thank you, Samuel G. Brooks, my enabler when I need you most. <laughs> the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, owned by Michael and Mark, two great friends and two great real talkers. The team at Clean Air Club, again, making sure that you can save money and breathe easy. We're building quite an army here of real talkers that are seeing these furnace filter replacements show up at your front door. Had a chance to get out on the golf course the other day, and one of my buddies said, this Clean Air Club. I go, yeah? He goes, why didn't I think of that? It's such a great idea. We then went on to talk about the hundred things that we wish we would have thought of, and a Clean Air Club's one of them. It's simple. They bring the replacement filters to your front door. You stay on schedule. You pay less than you would in store. You save money, and you breathe easy at cleanairclub.ca. 
Well, every week at RyanJesperson.com, we ask you to take a look at our question of the week. It's presented by our research and strategy partners at Y Station. And over the past week, we asked you how you felt about the situation at Grace Life Church. Now, this is the church just west of Edmonton. You know, if I, you know, I, if I'll tee it up again for you again, real quick, it's the church that has defied public health orders, gathering at full capacity. And then after their their pastor was jailed and the church was fed off by Alberta Health Services, despite a, a protest, demonstrators attempting to tear down that chain link fence, the church continued to gather in the context of what they were calling an underground church. And you may have seen our conversation late last week with the Reverend Dr. Greg Glatz, who really pushed back on the characterization of that underground church. Fascinating interview. I encourage you to check it out. 992 of you filled out our survey, our question of the week this past week, which we really appreciate. Uh, you, you were you were somewhat unyielding in your views for Grace Life Church. More than 80% of you said that you believe that the church should have been shut down a long, long time ago. 80% of you felt it was long past due when that fence went up. Now, when it comes to how you felt about charter violations, this is fascinating. The reaction to Alberta Health Services response, 80%, as mentioned, said it should have been done long ago. 17% of you said, yeah, but, you know, I mean, uh, they were fair to the church. Authorities were fair to the church with the number of warnings and opportunities to change that were given. How about this? When asked uh, if the public health orders that are being enforced are inherently unjust, 1% of respondents, 1%, so under 100, said yes. 3% felt that the churches, uh, the congregants, unalienable charter rights had been violated. 9% felt it was a violation of charter rights, but a justifiable one. Sam, this is one of the angles that I was curious to see where real talkers would land. We asked if respondents felt that the situation and the publicity around Grace Life Church was bad for the reputation of churches overall in some way, shape, or form. 61% of respondents felt that the situation at that church in particular was bad for the reputation of churches overall. What do you think? Um, I think it's an interesting, you know, when you talk to other people, and we've done this time and time and time again on this show, we've had uh, reverends and pastors and other people of faith on to talk about the Grace Life situation. And I think when you talk about other faith communities, they can see through the weeds on this one. They can see that, you know, Great Li- Grace Life is an outlier. They have a certain interpretation um, that many other people in the Christian community see as a very, very wrong interpretation of the way to conduct yourself in the Christian community and other people of faith get it. They get that this is wrong. This is an outlier. But I think that people are not that are not in faith communities, people that are completely on the outside can very much just see this and kind of paint them all as one brush and just say, well, it's another church. What do you expect? Right. So I, I, I do think that probably churches overall particularly from people outside that didn't really have much of a predisposition to try and engage with the church. This is just, you know, this is another point in the favor of why they just believe churches are bad. Yeah, and you know what? I, I will say that I actually think it's, first of all, really unfortunate, and, and second of all, I think unfair. Uh, it's unfortunate primarily, and it's unfair Because I think the majority of faith communities, and it doesn't matter what religion or what faith background we're talking about, the majority of you know, and you could give us examples of how you have pivoted, how you've adjusted, how you've sacrificed. I think that's why so many, you know, we've not had a single faith leader. I'm trying to think really quickly if this is a lie. (laughs) You don't want to lie about this kind of thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure, unless memory fails me, not a single faith leader has said no to our request for an interview on this. I guess the point I'm making is they've all been very eager to get in front of this and to talk about this. So, you know, Greg Hohalter, uh, the Reverend Anna Greenwood Lee, the Reverend Greg Glatz, all all these uh, typically evangelicals. uh, uh, Anna is uh, Anglican, if I remember correctly, Greg uh, uh, from the Christian Missionary Alliance. And then, of course, uh, Greg Glatz, an interesting uh, background, having been a Baptist minister for about 20 years and then now a reverend uh, within the United Church. And and by the way, he talked about that journey, too, about how he sort of felt like he was, uh, well, He outgrew his boots uh, in the Baptist denomination. Fascinating interview. 84% of you believed that the RCMP or Alberta Health Services, I should say, should have fined Grace Life staff and leadership. 83% of you, so pretty much call it the same, just just a hair less, 83% of you believe that the churchgoers 
should have been fined. People attending, 43% say there should have been more arrests. I mean, think about that, though, the, the optics of, of, of right and people protesting and you're, you're, you're putting dad and mom over the hood of the minivan in cuffs while the, while the kids cry and the television cameras are rolling. And, and then all of a sudden Ezra Levant's in there raising money, taking money from your grandparents' pension to pat his own pockets, talking about how, you know, they're, they're going to come up with some website address like, you know, free the jailed grace life. Uh, you know, parents.ca or something Don't like that. Don't give him ideas. Yeah, well, he's got all the ideas he needs. Uh, but you get the idea. Arrests, I would imagine, even, even law enforcement would say that is our last resort. 14% believe that Alberta Health Services should have taken an education-first approach with Grace Life leadership. Um, with respect to the 14% that voted for that, uh, let me say that there was no shortage, well... <laughs> I was going to say there's no shortage of education here. I take that back. But when it comes to education around the pandemic or education around the rules or the public health measures, there is no possible way that church leadership at Grace Life does not understand the rules that they're breaking. There's just no way. 3% of our respondents said that you think Alberta Health Services got it right with the measures that they put in place and here are some of the other things we love. We love that when we leave it blank and we ask you to chime in and just tell us what else is on your mind. A listener said consequences should have happened as soon as the first rule was broken. Uh, I've had three children. I love a good rule <laughs> with easily seen consequences. Many of you said in different contexts, the church should be stripped of tax exempt status. Another said the actions should have been called out by the premier. Alberta's government has been silent. Another says freedom of religion does not equal freedom from consequences. If they continued to flout the rules, close the church and turn it into affordable housing. Who? <laughs> Who? Another question we put in front of you has the saga of Grace Life Church changed the way you think about churches and their role in the community? This was interesting. 27% said, I think that they give all churches a bad name by acting this way. 34% say, they give a certain type of church a bad name, which is an interesting distinction. And 34% as well said, I think that this church is, is, generally speaking, a bad apple in a generally good bunch. And then it can be dangerous to draw conclusions about a whole group based on the actions of one member. I would be among that 34%. That would, that would be my personal inclination. Some of the other comments that you passed along, we thought this was really interesting. Based on your understanding of his teachings... I had a conversation with Chris Henderson, the chief strategist at Y Station, and he, he said to me, do you think that this question's a little too loaded? What would Jesus do? I said, absolutely not. I mean, ultimately, that's the central question. That should be the central question that is asked and answered every time people consider matters of faith. What would, I mean, let me be clear, matters of Christian faith. What would Jesus do? That's the whole point. Here's what some of you said. I believe he would have asked others to help protect others from this disease, staying away from one another, not gathering at a church until a large portion of the population is fully vaccinated. Another said, do what's best for the weakest among us. Wear a mask and stay home. Now, this says Jesus always sided with the marginalized. He would do everything he could to help the helpers. He would tell his flock to stay home to protect all, especially essential workers. Another says he would be ashamed to be involved in what happened at Grace Life. It's incredibly disrespectful of Enoch First Nations land where people trespassed and damaged property. These congregants are risking harm to their fellow worshipers by violating public health orders. They somehow believe they're better than others and more deserving of gatherings. This is not close to anything I understand about Jesus and what he taught. Another says, let's stop talking about grace life. Part of me feels that way, too, to be quite honest with you. There are a lot of things I want to stop talking about. The fact of the matter is pretty outlandish examples of some of the reasons why I think we continue to languish with the worst COVID-19 positivity rate in the entire country. That's right here in the province of Alberta. And still we hear from people complaining about a 
surrendering their freedoms, right, about a loss of liberty, so to speak. We have patriots speaking out. A, a significant portion of our week last week was spent talking about, you know, people who have quickly become prominent, pushing back against things like, you know, vaccine confidence or mask orders or public health protocols. And, and it's led to some interesting conversations in my quiet moments at night. I lie awake and I wonder, is the work that we're doing here by facilitating these conversations actually accomplishing anything? Is it productive? Is it important? And I guess it all comes down to this. Do you feel like we're talking about what matters Do you feel like we're focusing on the areas of impact that demand public conversation, that demand some gutsy questions, that demand a better understanding of where members of the general public land? And and, and that typically is is what drives the majority of the conversations here on the show. We're going to take the exact same approach to analyzing the federal budget tomorrow. What jumps out at real people? What matters most to your average Ordinary citizens, the types of people that gather here in community every day, whether it's live or whether it's later, whether it's on YouTube or Mixler or your favorite podcast app. We're grateful for it. And the show's nothing without your feedback. So let me encourage you to, as we say goodbye today, check out RyanJesperson.com. Check out this week's question of the week. A reminder, this week, we're asking you, inspired by Rob White's tragic passing in the North Saskatchewan River, and our interview with his family, his remarkable wife, Roberta, his kids, Alliance and Strider, his friend, Chris. How do we show appreciation for the people we love? How do we support people in our community? We're going to also, of course, do what we can to promote and support the GoFundMe that will assist Rob's family at this difficult time. Please do answer our question of the week. 992 responses last week. We'd love to see it hit 1,000 here. Now, of course, every Monday to start off every week, we wrap up with positive reflections, and that's coming up in just a moment. First, let me remind you that, of course, we also blow off a little steam on Fridays with Trash Talk, and you can submit your rants and your raves to talk at ryanjesperson.com. It's presented by Local Waste, who's been handling garbage and recycling for independent and corporate businesses, privately and publicly owned, large and small, for more than 25 years. They love talking trash and they want to compete for your business. Check them out today. Regardless of the size of what you're doing, maybe you just need to bin temporarily. Local Waste can help you out at localwaste.ca. Ask for Lauren McKell or Chris when you give them a shout. Also wanted to recognize the team at Kubi Energy. By now, you know that they're, well, they're experts on solar installations, big and small, whether it's your garden shed or whether it's the Edmonton Convention Center in Alberta and BC, their team of Tesla certified installers are working to help people make that energy transition and live a more sustainable life. Plus, they find ways to make it cost less by exploring all the different avenues and incentives that exist. Plus, they handle all the paperwork. You can find more on that at kubienergy.ca. As we start off our broadcast week every Monday, the team at Kubi Energy presents Positive Reflections. We received this video over the weekend from one of our team members, As a matter of fact, he's our managing director, a guy by the name of Josh Dunford who's doing an amazing job. He has a vacation property on Valdez Island, about an hour away from Vancouver. He was laying on his hammock over the weekend when a a family of sorts went on by. Have a listen. Is there any better sound than orcas? From what is that, Sam? 50 meters away? Yeah, it's incredible. I 30 love meters that. away? Unbelievable. If you're watching this on YouTube, you're probably going to go back like I did and watch that three or four <laughs> times. If you hear it on the podcast, to me, just the blowhole of a whale is, is like enough to make my day and bring a smile to my face. I absolutely love it. We also wanted to focus on this. I'm so grateful that Landy drew my attention to the Facebook group Alberta Aurora Chasers. Oh, I'm a proud member. I am too. It's fantastic. Sam, I, I, first of all, 
I had no idea that the, the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights were, were so prominent or, or, or even predictable. I'm learning so much of, of what these Aurora chasers are, are able to do with regards to tracking it down. But second of all, the photography. Are you kidding me? Did we? Did you have any idea so many talented photographers live and, and walk among us? Again, apologies if you're on the podcast, but check this out. These, these are just some. These are just over the past few days, like like this one from Brad McMillan. I mean, look at that. Are you kidding me? Or how about this photo? This one from Carl James. Stunning time lapse. Absolutely amazing. And this one from Hope Sirat. Look at that photo. I mean, these are incredible. Sam, I just yanked these off from the last few days. I mean, there are months and months and months worth of these types of images like this from Pierre-Luc Cormier. I mean, that to me, that's a photo you almost get painted or at least framed. Absolutely stunning. Shannon Qureshi with this one. Unbelievable. Do yourself a favor today and go ahead and subscribe to the Alberta Aurora Chasers Facebook group. Do you have any photos up there? I don't know. Oh, I think I might have posted one like three years ago, but it, yeah. wasn't, it can't compete with these. I've been itching to do some Aurora photography lately. Forever modest. If oh. I know anything about you, I know that this is now going to spur something, and within seven days, you're going to... There's no pressure, but I shouldn't do that. <laughs> because if it now, now you are going to go do it. But, oh, man, absolutely stunning stuff. And, and thank you, Landy, for putting that on our radar. And finally, I wanted to read this from Robert. Robert says, you know, I was going to write something for Trash Talk on Friday, but... But to be honest, over the last year, we've all suffered so much loss, and, and sometimes that gets me in the dumps. And and so instead, I decided to make a list of things I'm grateful for, for positive reflections. Robert says, up until 2020, a lot of my life I describe as being on autopilot. Same day, same week, same month, over and over again. And, and this last year is forced to reset. So I thought I'd make a list for real talkers of some of the things that I'm grateful for today. This is from Robert. I love this. My loved ones and I are alive and healthy. I've been able to spend deep and meaningful amounts of time with my wife and kids with no disruption. I've been able to work with my dad. I get to see him often, and I'm so grateful for that. I forgot how much I enjoy, and I missed a good walk, bike ride, or just going out in nature. I've taken the time to read and learn and reflect on my life. I've learned about the immense privilege I have as a white-looking male, and, and I've learned the realities of the suffering and oppression of others. I've developed a deeper understanding of the real value that our healthcare and education systems to provide to society. The ability I have to provide for my family and have a roof over my heads is not lost on me. Food supply. I took it for granted. I showed up at grocery stores with little regard to who or where it came from. Scientists, doctors, and healthcare workers, y'all are heroes. Platforms like Real Talk that provide the space for meaningful and transparent sharing of thoughts, ideas, and information. Shows like this have helped me learn more about myself and have an informed point of view. Golf, the ability to safely have an activity to connect with my pals. And since we can't ride in carts together, I now also have the independence to go directly to my own ball. Golfers will understand what he's really saying is dropping another ball with nobody noticing. Robert says the pandemic. Just kidding, pal. I would never call you a cheat. The pandemic's really shone a light, he says, on people's perspectives and priorities. I've learned who my real friends are and who I want in my life. I've learned more songs on guitar in the last year than I have in the 15 years previous. Most recently, Walking on Sunshine. And Albertans, in the last couple of weeks, all the most vulnerable people in my life made it to vaccination. I'm so grateful to every Albertan that made sacrifices to reduce the spread of this awful virus that allowed them to make it to this point. Says Robert, I see you and I thank you. Stay safe, Real Talkers, and be well. From Robert. We love it. What a positive reflection. Make it a great rest of your Monday, friends. We'll talk budget and 420 tomorrow on our joint committee, our Puff Puff panel. We'll see. We'll decide between now and then. We'll talk to you soon.